I'm Kevin Abdurrahman. My guest today is Hamza Hausawi. Good luck. We're yeah. gonna go fight right now. Good luck. The cousin. He does have an amazing voice. <laughs> Without sounding creepy, I could just, just sit here and listen to him. Come on, man, you're not helping yourself. <laughs> But like, you're not helping me save this young. This is not what I want to do. That's not my goal right now. Man, I'm hungry right now. Maybe if I eat, I'm going to be able to create. Yeah. And then, it's yeah. true. And then I act very cool. I'm like, thank you. And I like, <laughs> when I left, I was like, yes. And I see people going in, coming out crying. I see people going in, coming out smiling. I see, and I'm like, man. This is a rainbow of emotions. I'm like, as if I'm at the dentist. You know what I mean? <laughs> But when you call me, baby, I know I'm not the only one. My guest today is a super fly guy. He's got the looks, he's got the smile, he's got the moves. And boy, has he got the voice. Man, this guy's got a hell of a voice. I don't even know how to describe his voice. Soulful, serene, or as one publication said, smooth as honey. He also embodies what I've been saying for many years, to be kind, be ambitious, and to be grateful. He is unmistakably pure and kind. He has this inspiring hunger and ambition and a demeanor that exudes gratitude. My guest hails from Saudi Arabia, where the language spoken is Arabic, of course. But my guest speaks English with such eloquence. English that was self-taught through listening to music, watching and replaying horror movies and cartoons. From a young age, my guest gravitated to music. R&B, soul, and pop. My guest first performed on stage in 2008 at a talent show in Jeddah. Today, my guest is a renowned singer, a songwriter, a thinker, a hard worker who wakes up with music on his mind and music running through his veins. A guy who is passionate about life, a guy who, through music, helps give you a deeper understanding of how we behave as humans. My guest has recorded his music all around the world, including the Metropolis Studio in London, the place where many famous artists have recorded. The likes of Michael Jackson, Freddie Mercury, Adele, Amy Winehouse, Beyonce, Elton John, Madonna, Rihanna, you get the idea as well as performing live to audiences of over 150,000 people, millions of people have watched my guest through social media, TV, and cable networks. He has opened for Jay Holiday in Abu Dhabi, Justin Bieber in Dubai, and shared the stage with Tamar Hosni in Riyadh. He also roams in the same circles as the likes of Teddy Riley. And if you know, then you know. We see a lot of him in Dubai and Saudi Arabia collaborating with large brands for their ads, music videos, and live performances. The likes of Nike, Mobily, Maktoum Airport, Dior, and Apple Music. He has been featured on ET Arabia, The Insider, NBC, Dubai TV, Netflix, for a show called The Flex, and many more. He is the voice behind many of the songs that we love, like Falling, Frame of Mind, Finding You, Love a Little, and many more. And yes, they're all available on Amazon and Apple Music. So after this conversation, make sure you go and show him some love. Now, remember when I started, I said, my guest has an amazing voice. Well, it wasn't just a personal opinion. In 2015, X Factor Arabia had a winner. The winner is the guest and brother I'm delighted to have here today. He has humility, he has soul, and he has news for you that you too can be inspirational if you choose to keep your mind receptive, heart welcoming and eyes open. My guest is not just a current legend, but I truly believe that he's a legend in the making. The R&B kid of Saudi Arabia, the kid known by many as AZ, the kid you probably know by his signature phrase, the Jadawi kid. 
The man whose voice resonates with a global audience. The man who wants to influence the world. The man whose message is, if you have a dream, you can achieve it. The voice of life experiences. The voice that raises awareness. The voice of passion and possibility. The voice of inspiration. Saudi Arabia's voice of R&B. The voice that makes his country proud. The voice that makes us all proud. Most important of all, and without a doubt, the voice that makes his mum proud. This is How Do They Do It. I'm Kevin Abdurrahman. My guest today is Hamza Hausawi. Bro, I appreciate you making the time. How you time. doing, man? You good? Very good. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to have you. Thank you, man. Um, one thing that really stood out for me was your business etiquette. Mm. The fact that you arrived early. Uh, thank you, man. The fact that when I sent you an email, you didn't mm. reply with an email. Mm. You gave me a phone call. Yes. And immediately I was going, this guy is different. <laughs> I'm glad you had a number on the email. <laughs> you know, I put it there, we're in the Middle East. Yeah. That's the one thing about the Middle East, everyone's reachable. Absolutely. Um, where did you learn your business etiquette? Experience, I guess. Yeah? Experience. Even though I studied a little bit of business and college before I dropped out mm -hmm. because of music but I never really learned that but I think experience is the things that I try to find from other people yes. that I don't get to experience and I go like you know what I don't want people to go through that with me so what would you say were some experiences where you learned some lessons that perhaps could be of, of value to the viewers and listeners mm -hmm. oh, maybe like say three three business lessons or business etiquette lessons mm -hmm. let's see that sometimes when you have a deal with somebody mm -hmm. and they want to cancel it, they never verbally or through email tell you that. That they're going to cancel it. Yeah, they just want you to get it. You know what I mean? Even though you're preparing something for them. Like when there is a show that's going to happen mm -hmm. and uh, something happens that prevents that show from actually occurring, but nobody tells you anything. Interesting. A lot of things that has to do with finances. Mm -hmm. You know, because when it comes to an artist, there's, uh, there's like this general knowledge that if we agree that I'm going to come and perform, you have to pay the certain amount. Sure. And before I go on stage, you have to pay the other. Sure. Certain. But you get, you get people that don't give you anything till three months after the show. Interesting. Uh, but these are all experiences that I had to go through in the beginnings. Yes. You know what I mean? Uh, a lot of people use exposure as a currency. Yes when you're starting. So this is a message to all the new artists. That's fine. But it comes to a point where, you know what? Exposure is not a currency. Because a lot of people use that. Like, I want you to come and perform at my show. Uh, there won't be any payment. But there are a lot of people. It's exposure. Just come through. Does that even work in this day and age where when you have YouTube, when you have Facebook, when you have Instagram? It does because a lot of artists want to go on stage. Okay. YouTube is amazing. We yes. want to be on YouTube, but seeing the people looking at you interacting and the with feel. you, that's different. So a lot of people use exposure as a currency and they yes. tell you, but we won't pay you, even though they, they might have the budget mm. to pay the artist. But they go like, you know what, May, because especially in our region, especially like, for example, in Saudi, yes. this thing is just starting. Mm -hmm. So a lot of artists don't really have the idea that this is going to be consistent. Yes. So there's a scarcity. They go like, if I don't go to this show, I might not get any other. Sure. So I'll go with exposure, cool. And somebody else get to pocket that money. You know so to aspiring artists, because once you're established like yourself, mm -hmm. people want you, you can command and say how, how it's going to go. People well, try though. I'm sure they do. They still try. <laughs> people try it with me. I have yeah. banks who post you know, 10, 11 figures in terms of profit, and then they reach out to hire me and they go, We're, we don't have the budget. And I send them their quarterly report that says, you just <laughs> made 300 million in profit. What do you mean you don't have a like budget? I, I was following your business. <laughs> yeah. People still do that. They try, sure. But for, for aspiring artists, people who are just coming up. What would be some useful business etiquettes that, you know, perhaps you would mm. tell Hamza Hausawi at 20? Mm. Well, I need to know, like, it's, it's very practical, yes. it's very detailed. Yes. Uh, I need to know how the stage looks like. Mm -hmm. I need to make sure that I rehearse on that stage at least for two hours, three hours, or two days before the show. Mm -hmm. 
I need to have a conversation with the audio engineers and the lighting engineers to understand exactly how I'm going to be presented and how people are going to look at it. Mm -hmm. At some point, we used to go to do shows, and we go on stage for the first time, 10 minutes before performing. And then we get surprised with some things, like there is no mic stand. I need a mic stand and because this is what I want to use for this certain song. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's very practical. Yes. But it is extremely important. And if I wanna, if I wanna make that general into a lot of other things, just pay attention to the details. Which requires planning and preparation. Exactly. Yeah. Pay attention to the details, especially if you're gonna go in front of people. If you're gonna go on stage, you need to walk on stage. You need to look. You need to see yes. how it is. Right. Yes. You need to have a feel of it, even when you go speak. Yes. You know. Absolutely. I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. You, you need to understand. I'm gonna look this way. I'm gonna look this way. I'm gonna look that way. One hundred percent. So preparation is very important and paying attention to details. What you say is interesting because when I'm working with clients, CEOs, world leaders, if they have the opportunity, mm. and in many cases, if they plan in advance, they do have the opportunity. Mm. I always tell them, arrive early, get exactly. yourself on stage because one of the also other benefits, apart mm. from preparing and making sure everything's mm. there, your mind gets a feel for things. Exactly. exactly. So that when it's actually time for game time, You've already been here. That's what your mind is telling you. We've been here. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's fantastic. So that's the same thing when it comes to performing. Because like when, when I'm when I'm on stage and I'm singing and I feel like with this song, I really want to go to this side of the stage and then during that verse I want to move all the yes. way there till I reach the chorus mm. of the song. You know what I mean? And I have to plan it. A lot of people will look on stage and feel like, oh, this artist is very natural. They prepared. Yes. They've been there. Yes. They were on that stage. They made sure that this is exactly what I'm going to do. That's right. And if you have a band with you, and you know, but you look at the basis. By the way, this part of the song, I'm going to look at you because I want everybody else to look at you as well to see what you're going to do at that part. And people think, oh, wow, they got amazing chemistry. They do, but they prepared. <laughs> they prepared for that chemistry exactly. to work. Exactly. Good stuff, man. Yeah, so that's uh, it's experience. Yeah. When you gave me that phone call, mm. I, I'm on I'm on the phone all the time. It's yeah. just, but you literally stood out from everyone else that I'd emailed mm. because I was just getting email responses. Yeah. Even though I might have had conversations in the past, mm. but you stood out because I sent you an email and you decided to respond with a phone call. Yes. Why is that? Because in my mind, mm. you automatically stood out. And I have a feeling that you apply this in every aspect of your yes, life. Yes, absolutely. And I feel that it's a beneficial tip for our viewers and listeners. I feel like because you came to me with something different. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what, I don't want to respond via email. I want to make sure that this happens. And I want to get a feel of that person. Because I went and I looked up the things that you do and I'm like, this relates to me. Mm. And I feel like I'm really going to connect with this guy. So let me give this guy a phone call. Because my manager saw the email, and he's like, okay, I'm going to respond. I'm like, no, don't. Let me, let me give Kevin a phone call. Let's have a conversation on the phone. Mm. Let's get to know each other. And I feel like that phone call is really what made this happen. Yes. Because it's, it's, it was engraved in my mind. Yes. I was like, you know what? No, there is something. I made a phone call. I spoke to somebody, and I need to make this happen. Yes. So that's uh, to stand out as well. I appreciate it, man, mm. because it really did also, yeah, engrave in my mind. Mm. And when I think about it, this is actually a powerful b mm. business tip. Yes. It's easy to shoot out an email. Extremely but easy. One of the things I did to stand out in business is I make my number available. Mm. And often when event planners or event organizers, yeah. they're at a stage where we know, okay, they're serious and we need to do a booking. I'll actually get on the phone and call. Yeah. And to the shock of many, I'm not sure why, but I'll use it until it becomes the norm. Yeah. They're like, is this Kevin Abdurrahman? I'm like, yeah. They're like, oh, I never thought I'd speak to you on the yeah, phone. I'm like, we didn't expect this. That's what they said. Hello. That's very true. Because my mind is I'm in the business of communication. Mm. You're hiring me as a motivational speaker. Exactly. Well, let me talk to you. Exactly. Yeah, you'll exactly. see the skill set in action. And there, there, are, there is power in words. Yes. Oh, you know it. Yeah, there is power in words. Like I can, I can give you a whole speech written down about motivation and about strength and about success. But I can give you just one paragraph and I will voice it to you and yes. it's going to affect you even more than what you read. You know what I mean? It's, it's vibration. Yes. It's, if, if you hear it, if you hear that tone, 
if you hear that uh, conviction in the voice, yes. it's going to leave an impression. So I really believe in that, especially that I sing. Yes. So I truly do believe that there, are, there is power in the voice. Get inspired. Whether you're in Dubai for business or pleasure, the last thing you want to do is blow your budget on accommodation, which is why I recommend you check out our host venue partners, Rove Hotels. Beyond being price sensitive, what I love about Rove Hotels is the fact that they are a combination of cafe, culture, and just coolness. Even my guests, many of them, when they arrive before we record or after we finish recording the podcast, they actually comment. They go, wow, this place is cool. The vibe is amazing. And it is amazing. So if you're in Dubai for business or pleasure, I recommend you check out our host venue partners, Rove Hotels. This episode is brought to you by M Dojo. Whether you're in business or new to business, you need three things. A good website, traffic, and being able to convert that traffic into paying customers. That's what MDojo does best. They're able to create for you a functional state-of-the-art website, drive targeted traffic, and put in all the elements needed in order to convert that into paying customers. Isn't that what you want? Of course it is. Give the team at MDojo a call and see how they can help you increase your sales and profits. Tell them I sent you. Their website, mdojo.co. How did you develop your speaking voice? Because I think that's mm. something that hopefully you could have some tips mm. for our viewers that and listeners. That is a very interesting question. Uh, I think that started at an early age, but it wasn't even the intention. Okay. It wasn't even the intention to actually develop a speaking voice, but me and my cousin. He does have an amazing voice. <laughs> <laughs> Without sounding creepy, I could just, just sit here and listen to him. Radio. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why? Well, and it's got the looks, but hey. Sorry, <laughs> I had to say it. What we used to do, we used to have this uh, small cassette player. Yes. And we just put a cassette in there and record. And just talk. We act like it's, uh, it's a news or a weather report or whatever it is. Okay. And we just go back to listening to it. We just enjoyed that. Recording yourself yeah, and, and then hearing and it then out. listening to it again. It's not even, the intention was not even to, to like develop a skill. Yes. We just enjoyed that. Yes. You know what I mean? And PlayStation, of course. Of course. But that, for some reason, it had an effect. I don't know what it is. And I'm not sure many kids really did the same thing. Or yeah. maybe they did. I don't know. But that, you know, made me feel like I enjoy that. And then that turned into singing. Uh huh. Before I sang, I used to rap. Yes. And before I rapped, I used to dance. But that's how it transitioned. I used to listen to our voices when we talk, and we're like, okay, let's do this again. And we used to create dialogues and stuff like that. And what were you noticing to do it again? Like, what, when you'd hear it and you go, okay, we need to do this again? Mm. Uh, it's the dialogue, usually. Okay. You know what I mean? Uh, I say something and he replies with another thing and then we go like, it's going to be more interesting if you say this instead of that. How you old know? were you guys? I think we were like six. Cute. Yeah, yeah. we were like six, seven. That's, uh, that's around that time. Plus, we didn't have any friends, so... <laughs> You're an introvert? Extremely. Extremely, because I'm an only child. Yes. And I was raised by my mother. And I, I used to spend all my time at home, in my room, just watching VCRs. I had all these uh, cassettes, and I just used to watch movies. And Michael Jackson, religiously. Like, I had a, like a couple of cassettes of Michael Jackson, and I used to watch that daily, because I was extremely fascinated by that dude. And that introduction of Michael Jackson was made by your mom? Yes. She she yeah. brought in Michael, ja Michael, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson and Prince. Prince. Right? Yeah? Prince was by my mother. Okay. But she didn't really ask me to listen to him because you know Prince and you know his music. Sure. I was young. Yes. You know what I mean? So I was not supposed to listen to that. But I found the cassette and I'm like, nobody's here. Let me watch it. Yeah. And I was like, now I know. But Michael Jackson it used to be a fascination for my cousins. Okay. They loved Michael Jackson and they loved the dances that he used to do. Yeah. So when I was watching him, it's like watching an alien. 
you know? It's amazing how one guy can have such an impact to yeah, so many incredible. generations and still does to this very day. Incredible impact, like to the point where there is nobody that does not know Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. I, I won't believe it if somebody doesn't. You know what I mean? How I'd, true is that? I'd actually be surprised if somebody does not know who Michael Jackson is. And that makes me feel like I wish I could get to that level. You know what I mean? As an artist, like yes. if you hear the name Hamza House, how are you gonna go like, yeah, I know. Even if you don't listen to the music. But to know the man. Yeah. To One know name, the man. effect and the One hundred percent. I have no doubt. The way you're going. Hopefully. Yeah. Um let's speak about your mom because it's a Absolutely. pip. She is um not only an integral person mm -hmm. um in your life, but also uh, a pivotal moment in your life. Yes. Perhaps take us back to your upbringing, mm. um, some, of, some of the things you remember of your mom, uh, what she taught you, and the pivotal moment. I think that goes back to the voice as well. Okay. Because I used to be an extremely shy kid. If you look at all my pictures as a kid, I did not smile at all. Interesting. Because I did not like the camera. Interesting. Yeah, but there is a lens that is just staring at me and I'm like, I'm not very comfortable with that. And I did not speak to people. Like if we go out and if I want to get something, I was like, Mom, can we, can you speak to that person because I want that thing? And I think at some point my mom was fed up. So she's like, whenever we go out, I am not going to say a word. You're going to speak to everybody. If we go out to buy groceries, for example. It's on you. Yeah. She's like, I want to get that. Speak to the guy. And I'm like, excuse me? Speak up. She always said that. Speak up. Speak up. Speak up. I remember that. In Arabic, always. When we go into the cab, for example. Before we go into the cab, she's like, we're going to this place. Tell him. She'd give you the heads up. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to this place. Tell him. And... I have to sit in front and I'm nervous because I have to speak. Yes. Because I have to confront people because I have to tell them something. And the word speak up that she used to tell me all the time, I believe that had a great effect on my voice as well. Yes. Because I had to speak up. People needed to listen to, the, to what I was going to say. And she was a teacher. So that's what she did. She stood in front of students and she spoke up. So she's like, I'll be down if my kid won't do the same. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I didn't, I didn't understand that, that then. It used sure. to bother me. Yes. Because I felt pressured. Like, just just throwing you in the deep yeah, end. Yeah, just don't do that to me, you know what I mean? But after some time, actually, it's when I grew all the way up, I was like, yeah, that, that was beneficial for me. I needed that. Yeah. Because that actually taught me to, to confront whenever I was put in a situation where confrontation is important yes. and necessary. So yeah, that was, one of, that was one of the greatest effects that she had on my life. That's fantastic. Yeah. And she used to always listen when I sing. To you when you would complain that you when, didn't want to do sing. it? When you sing, yeah. I apologize. Yeah. She used to always listen when I sing. Yeah. Even if I sounded bad, even, but she always felt like I'm gonna give him attention when he's doing that. I'm gonna let him feel like if he's singing right now, somebody's actually paying attention. That's interesting. Yeah. And when did you realize this at first? Uh, I like how old were you in terms of what's your earliest memory of her paying attention to you singing? When I was singing all the Disney movies, the, 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 the Disney songs that I used to listen to. Yes. Even the cassettes, like in the cassettes that we used to record me and my cousin, there was some singing. And I always tell her, come through and listen to it. She just sit there and listen with a smile on her face. I don't know if the singing was good. I have no idea. But she gave you the attention. But when she gave me that attention, I felt like, okay, maybe this is something that, that's good. You know what I mean? And this is something that I need to keep doing. And she used to give me tips here and there, what I need to do when I speak on, uh, like when we used to do these dialogues and stuff like that. So that attention really, really, really worked for me. And it, it encouraged me. Yes, yeah, yes. To, to get to this point. It's amazing that we don't give this is overlooked. Mm. We don't realize how powerful giving attention to someone, especially when they're starting out exactly. or not even realizing that they have this talent or potential, exactly. but how much the attention could actually 
help harbor or manifest or develop them, that is give them the true. confidence. That is very true. And especially like as a kid growing up, these things are very important. Yes. Because these are the things that are going to create your personality throughout the years. Absolutely. Yeah. She's no longer with us now. No. God rest her soul. God rest her soul. Um, how do you deal with that or how did you deal with it, especially mm. being so close? Mm. Um, I'm blessed to still have my mom, mm. uh, but I lost my father uh, when I was 24. Mm. Um, it's not easy. No. So if, yeah, I guess for someone who's lost a parent or a loved mm. one, um, how did you go about dealing with it? Or you know, what I was would you say is an effective way? It's yeah. quite young. I was 17 at the time. And God rest his soul, she lost a battle with breast cancer which is it's a vicious disease. Yes, it's difficult. Yeah. So for all the ladies out there, get checked up. Yes, 100%. All the time. Yes. Always. Yes. Do not neglect it yes. at all. And my mother was very strong to the point where nobody knew that she was struggling with that. Nobody. She did not tell anybody because she did not like the idea that somebody may pity her or yes. something like that. And when it happened, when I received the call from the hospital that told me to come, to, to go to the hospital, I knew. I knew something was up. And I think at that moment, I knew that I lost my mother. And we had so many plans about mm. so many things that we wanted to do. And there was a shift. That was a big shift in my life because all the things that I had lined up and the things that I wanted to do were actually connected to my mother or connected to her advice or the things that I wanted to do. And it, it, was, it was a feeling of being numb for a while mm. because I had to recalibrate. I had to go like, okay, she's not here anymore. What do I need to do? I need to do one, two, three, one, two, three. And then there was a lot of situations. I had to live with my auntie for a while. She's an amazing auntie. Yes. She's actually the person who raised my mother. And I had to stay with her for a while. And that was around the time, actually that was when I graduated high school and I had to go into college. But at the same time, I realized that I had to get a job. Yes. Because I did not want anybody to spend money on me. I felt like... You didn't want to be a burden. Exactly. I mm. felt like I didn't want to be a burden. I felt like I need to get a job. And then... When I got a job, I did not really focus in school as much because I felt like I need to keep this up because I need to support myself. Sure. And uh, after some time, I felt like when I was doing music and I felt like music was, was helps, helping me yeah, and it was support and all of that, I felt like I'm not going to do college anymore. At this stage, you had, you, had, you had been on a show and you were doing no, no, bits no, and pieces, was, not yet. That was before that. Okay. That was before that. That was actually in 2000 and end of 2008. Okay. Which 2008 was the first time I actually got on stage. And it was the only performance that my mother has seen of me. That was the only, the first performance is the only the performance, performance she saw. Yeah, yeah. The, the only performance she saw. And I actually remembered the attention that, that she used to give me listening to me singing. I saw that in her eyes when she was watching the video. So to me, that was a big push. I yes. was like, yeah, that's, this is the way that I want to go. And after some time, I decided that, you know what? I'm going to go out on my own. Mm -hmm. Spoke to my auntie. I'm like, I'm just going to go out on my own. I'm going to live by myself. And I'm going to support myself and do the things that I really want to do. And then that happened. Mm -hmm. And after some time, we got to X Factor. Yes. And it was... It was actually a very, it was a tough decision to make because every step that I made, I always remembered my mother. I was like, okay, what would she agree with? What would she be okay with? Mm. What would she tell me to do at that time? And I remember her watching me perform in 2008 when yes. I showed her the video. And I knew that she would want me to follow my passion. So in essence, you were using her spirit as a sounding board. Big time. Yeah. Big time. Like it was, it was a, a huge impact losing my mother. But at the same time, it made me really understand what life is. Mm. You know what I mean? This is life. It, it, death is a part of life. But at the same time, I felt like she gave me the tools to navigate. Yes. Whether it's 
an actual advice, whether it's her words, whether it's the, the, the scolding, whether it's uh, just remembering her personality in my mind and having hypothetical conversations with her yes. as, as an adult. Yes. I go like, if I had this conversation with her now, from what I remember from her... This, this is, is how, how it would go. Yeah, this is how it's going to go. Yeah. And that helped me a lot make those tough decisions. Get inspired. One of the questions that I get frequently asked is, Kev, how can I increase my motivation? We see great individuals, we see achievers, like many of the guests that I'm bringing on the show. They have the energy, they do so much, they're in a state of flow. How do they do it? Well, my team and I have released an article which I've made available on kevinabdurrahman.org forward slash blog, the ultimate biohacking guide to increasing motivation. Or you can simply Google Kevin Increase Motivation and the article should pop up right at the top. It's absolutely free. Read it and most important of all, take the bits and pieces that are relevant to you and apply it into your life to increase your motivation. I hope you find the article of value. If you do, feel free to leave your comments and also share it with your circle of friends. Again, you can Google it, Kevin Increase Motivation. It will be the first link that pops up or on my website, kevinabdurrahman.org forward slash blog Ta could you take us through one of the one of the decisions you had to make it's, the reason i'm mm -hmm. asking you this is because in life we're all faced yeah. with tough decisions all the time mm. um just wondering do you have a process mm. um that you go through when you're when you're thinking okay i have a job and i have this thing called mm. singing yeah this pays the bills because there's a landlord who doesn't care about your passion <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. what they care about is pay the rent yeah <laughs> And then there's this thing that's, mm. this is what I'm gravitating to. Yes. A decision like that, what, what, are you, what are you thinking about? And I'm just hoping that perhaps, you know, the, mm. the, with the people that resonate with your voice, um, it could just help them to consider what, what do they need to think about or what did you think about? I didn't make that decision alone. Okay. I had to get advice. I had to call up the closest people that I have in my life, my friends, mm. and get the advice from them. And it was very divided, like 50-50 divided. So unhelpful, like. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, people who actually really, really, really cared about me told me, go ahead. They're like, why are you even calling me, man? Just quit the job and go ahead. Do this, because we know you're going to make something out of yourself. And just as equally, people who really cared about me told me, man, stay in your job. Yeah. Make sure that you build something financially. Make sure that you're going to have something that's going to support you. And it's sound advice. Yes, if absolutely. If you think about it, yes, it's actually sound advice. 100%. But then, and it's coming from a place of care. Exactly. But then you go into, do I respond to logic? Or am I going to respond to my emotions? Mm -hmm. Like, which one? Which one do, do I need to pay attention to? And that's when I decided, you know what? This is a nice job. It's a good salary. Mm -hmm. But that's not what I want to do. Mm. That's not what I, where I see myself like five years from now. I saw a lot of people in there who's been there for 20 years, and it was not appealing to me. Yeah. This is like, not a pretty sight. Yeah, yeah I, I don't want to be here 20 years from now, 10 yes. years from now. And then I had that conversation with, with my boss. But that decision had two parts. I only wanted to take 10 days off. Okay, this I'm is thinking, when you're auditioning for X Factor. Yeah, I only wanted to take 10 days off so I can audition for X Factor. And in my mind, because in the Arab world, from what I've seen in all the shows that happened, the talent shows, nobody that got up there singing in English had actually won or reached a far level. So in my mind, maybe I'm not going to get very far. But what I really need is that audition on my resume. I want that audition to appear on TV. Mm -hmm. I want to take that video and I want to add it to my press kit yes. as a musician. Yes. So I can use it. And Get my CV looking good. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I, I went on this big channel and I was on stage and in front of me were those celebrities. That's going to look good. Mm. So I told my manager I only need 10 days and I'm going to be back. That's actually the decision that I made. Right. It was on my mind. And then... I went, th uh, my boss had an advice for me as well. He's like, man, at some point you're going to get married. You need to stick to a job and have your salary. And I'm like, man, you're not helping yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
like, you're not helping me stay at this job. This is not what I want to do. That's not my goal right now. But then when I went over there and, and I saw the energy around, like... While auditioning. Yeah, but even before auditioning, all the contestants were in the same hotel. Yes. And every room you go into and every floor is just somebody singing or playing music. And I'm like, this is heaven. This is a festival. I'm like, this is heaven. I love this. I, I, I want this for my life. And we used to stay up all night just singing. All night. We go to sleep. We wake up and we just sing all day and all night. And I'm like, wow. I'm enjoying this. Like, I love this. Even if I go broke, I want to I wanna be in there. And then the auditions happen. When the, when the first auditions happen, and I got on stage for the first time in front of people that are gonna tell me if I was good or bad, I never had that. And at that point, was that the largest stage you had been on? Or the most prominent stage in terms of yes, it was the most what's on the line? Stage. Yes, especially the idea that somebody's gonna judge what you do. After you're done singing, somebody's going to tell you if you did good or not. I didn't have that. Not before that day. I always go on stage and I perform and I leave and I criticize my own self. Sure. But at that point, somebody else is going to criticize me. Mm. So I went on stage. And actually, we went to that stage at 11 a.m. And I performed at 10 p.m. First audition? Yeah. We were just sitting there. Wow. Waiting. And I see people going in, coming out crying. I see people going in, <laughs> coming out smiling. I see, and I'm like, man. This is a rainbow of emotions. Like, as if I'm at the dentist. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like, I'm, and I, I'm getting nervous. And I'm just drinking hot tea the whole time just to preserve my voice. And uh, having conversations with a lot of people and then noticing that I might lose my voice and I just go quiet for some time. It was a roller coaster. Mm. Like it, it was a storm in my head. And then at 10 p.m., that's when they called my name. Can I ask you, up until that point, because from what, what I'm hearing you say, yeah. it seems like he's really positive, like the hotel yeah. full of artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're singing and dancing. That's such a positive attitude to have. I was happy, man. Yeah. But the reason I'm bringing it up, mm. it's because you can go into environments of competition mm. and the attitude is, damn, there are and all I these people. That. And I saw that. But you I saw didn't that feel from it. Some people. No, not at all. I was like, I want to be friends with everybody over here. But I saw that. I saw that some people felt like this is a competition and they were just in the corner, just plotting, you know, <laughs> how am I, how am I going to outsing this person? Oh, I heard this person sing a note. Let me try and do it by myself. You know, I, I felt that and I saw it, but, but I, I didn't get it. I'm like, like, it's not the Coliseum. We're not gladiators. <laughs> Nobody's going to kill anybody. We're just going to sing. You know what I mean? We're just going to sing. We're just going to sing and have fun. Yeah. So it's your turn, 10 p.m.? No, oh, it was my turn at 10 p.m. That's when they called my name. And when they called my name, it's not like they're going to give me the mic and I'm going to go on stage, like, immediately. No, I'm going to be backstage, and there are three other people going before me. Okay. So I can actually see them and see them performing. And they're still coming out crying. And I'm like, man. You're standing where, is it Terry Crews, where you're standing behind the curtains? Exactly, and, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, oh, that's where that we were. terrible. And you just watch, and I'm like, man, I'm nervous. I'm nervous. And these people are actually, like, they're, they're singing in Arabic, and they sound real nice. Some are singing in English, and they sound real nice as well. And they're just telling them off, like, nah, we can't do this. Nah, it, it didn't sound real nice. So I'm like, All right, thanks for the warm-up. <laughs> taking deep breaths. I'm like, man, what am I going to do? I'm just gonna go up there and I'm gonna have fun. I'm like, I'm gonna do my best to make sure that this audition goes on TV. Was that the plan, Hamza? Yes, that was the plan. Let's stick to the plan. <laughs> Let's stick to the plan. And then I went on stage and I performed. And I think I did Sam Smith, uh, You're Not the Only One. I think that's the song that I did. And after I was done, the music would, like stopped. Could you give us a couple of verses just for my own, <laughs> just for my own pleasure? Oh, one second. Let me remember. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. Just for, uh, this is purely for Kev's pleasure. <laughs> He's got an amazing voice. Only if you want to. Uh, oh, I remember. You say I'm crazy, but 
But you don't think I know what you've done But when you call me baby I know I'm not the only one Man. <laughs> Thank you. Man. Now I got tickles. No, so, <laughs> so you went there with an attitude, have fun. Hamza, stick to the plan. Yeah, this is for your CV, buddy. Stick to the plan and let me just do this. And I performed that song. And after that, like, I was just waiting for their reaction. But at the same time, I was like, in my mind, I was like, I did good. I'm happy Felt with good. it. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy with it. But I'm looking at the cameras. I'm like, this better be on TV. <laughs> this better this be on TV. This better be cut yeah, out. This better be on TV. <laughs> like, don't cut me out. You know, what I mean? you know when they have cuts of people who messed up, and yeah. they're just like two seconds of each. I'm like, nah. Like, give me my full performance, <laughs> please. And then I had the most positive feedback from the judges. It was incredible. Like. I don't know if they like if they were very serious about it, but anyway, that was exactly what I was looking for. They're like, you remember we what want they said? you. They're like, we want you to continue. We want you to t to be on the show. We did not expect this. We did not expect that we're gonna have this at the end of this day. Not at 10 p.m. We didn't. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, okay, that's amazing. And I got off stage, and I am extremely happy. And they're like, you're gonna go into the next round. I was extremely happy. I gave them my mic, and then as soon as I got down, I'm like, my job. <laughs> Wait a second. I was like, oh, my job. I only, I thought that I'm only gonna be here, but then I have to stay for another elimination phase, and in that phase, you don't get to prove yourself. You just stand there, and they tell you, yeah, we want you, or you're gonna go home. Like. I, there isn't, I'm going to sing and I'm going to try to win. No. Right. There is, I'm just going to stand in there in front of all these people next to all the contestants and they're going to decide whether I stay or not. And at that time, it's too late if I didn't have a job. Sure. But I was like, um, I'm not, I'm not going to get back. I don't want to go back. And you were willing to make that sacrifice? Yeah, yeah. I was like, I'm not going to go back. Even if I don't get chosen? If I don't get chosen, I'm going to go back. I'm going to eat breadcrumbs for a couple of months, and I'm going to find another job. But this opportunity, I'm not sure I can find something like that again. Mm. And we went to that other stage. Mind you, at that time, I did not send an email to my boss. I did not receive a call. I didn't even answer the phone. I was like, I'm not going to say anything. This is the business etiquette you don't take. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say. I did not send an email. I was like, oh dear. I, I, was, I was just too nervous. I was too nervous to actively make that decision, even though I know past those 10 days, In I'm, your heart, out you knew. I'm out of a job. I'm out of a job. I know that for sure. Yeah. But I did not actively want to make that decision. I didn't want to speak it into existence. Yes. I didn't want to call my boss and tell him I'm not coming back. I didn't want to do that. Like I wanted the world to make that decision for me, which is something that I learned later on that I shouldn't do. Sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even if you know what, what the outcome is going to be, if it's in your hand, take the action. Sure. If anything, it's just going to add to your character and your personality. So we got to the other phase. And in the other phase, we just stand there. And they and, pick. And they call the names. And you make it through. Yeah. I think we were, we were 36 and only 12 were going to make it. And we were just standing there waiting. And you know, they got to use that suspense and all sure, of that. Yeah, and yeah. They're just looking at each person and uh, making you nervous. And everybody's sweating. And then they called my name, the first name. I was like, that's it. I'm good. They called that Hamza Osawi. I'm like, yes. But I acted very cool. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> and I left, when I left, I was like, yes. But then I knew, I was like, yeah, this is, this is where the journey begins. But that moment made me realize that, you know what? This is, this is interesting. Just going through something like that doing something that you love and going through that emotional pressure of mm. 
not knowing uh, like whether you're going to make it or not, it's necessary. It's necessary because if you made it, you're going to cherish it. Even if you didn't, you're just going to have that memory and it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect, hopefully positively, yes. all the decisions that you're going to take on. Kind of like yeah. when your mom put you in the front seat. Exactly. Speak up, buddy. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, the pressure cooker. So when that happened, I knew that I made the right decision by quitting the job. Mm. And then I was like, I'm just going to go on from now. While you were there, mm. what did you develop to become mm. a better artist or to become better? I ask this because mm. you've got the tagline, student of arts, yeah. life, and business. Mm. Did I say it in the right order? Yes. Yeah. And so I was going to mm. come to it and perhaps we can come back to it again at some point and, mm. and visit that tagline. But throughout that process, what did you learn? Like, what was the kind of feedback? What did you develop to get better? Because you became mm. remarkably better. Let's talk about art. Sure. Since we have these three tags. Sure. About art, when it comes to that experience, it was, it was the, the, the time that I was most exposed to all these musicians and these different voices and these different people who play different instruments. I heard things in front of me that I did not imagine that I would hear coming out of a person that's sitting right there in the same room. And I'm like, I want to sing like that. Mm. I want to use that skill, you know? This is different artists. Yeah, it's just like when, you, when you're listening to somebody speak and they use a very interesting word and you're like, I'm going to use that. Yeah, yeah, that's a real nice word. I want to use it. It's exactly like that. And seeing all these artists on stage, how they move and how they hold the mic and their facial expressions, I'm like, I'm going to copy that. Mm. I'm going to take that and I'm going to make it my own. Uh, listening to and watching how they write, because a lot of them were just sitting down writing songs. They're playing the guitar or playing the violin. One guy was a beast on the violin. And I just hear them freestyling with each other. And it, looks, it looked like these people knew each other for years, but they only just met. And musically, they're just very in tune, and the chemistry was incredible. And I, I learned that too. And I'm like, if I'm ever going to be with a band on stage, I need to make sure that the chemistry is there. Mm. I need to make sure that we actually connect as people mm. and then as musicians. In terms of the business, I, it was a lot of media training because we had to be on camera maybe three to four times a week. That's minimum. Yes. We always had to be on camera to speak about everything, anything that happened. Two people had an argument, we need to sit in front of the camera and talk about it. We went to, to a shop to get some clothes, we need to sit in front of the camera and talk about it. We had a good experience this week, we need to sit down and talk about it. We had a bad experience, we need, you know what I mean? And every time you need to articulate yourself differently mm. just so you won't sound repetitive. Yes. So that was a lot of media training. And they would tell you, we want you to say this and that. We want you to say this and that, but say it your own way. And uh, they ask you a question, and then you start answering, and then they're like, no, you need to repeat the question and then answer, because the interviewer's voice is not going to be on the camera. So whoever's watching needs to know what are you going to talk about. So that was intense, yes. but I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I'm like, these are some skills that I'm going to use later on. Now let's go to life. Mm. I made friends that I still speak to to this day. And I know for sure that we will remain friends till, you know, forever, hopefully. And did you have character realizations? You know, because sometimes, and actually often, mm. we realize more about ourselves or we yeah. become more self-aware because you seem like a self-aware person. Yeah. It happens usually when we're put in pressure or we're put yeah. in, you know, these kind of situations. Yes. What did you realize about yourself? I realized that I am competitive, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's not in a, in a malicious way. Mm -hmm. It's not in a way that would create enemies. Mm -hmm. I realized that it's just like before you go into a boxing match, I would just tell you, good luck. We're yeah. going to go fight right now. Good luck. I'll beat you up. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'll beat you up, but we'll smile about it. Yes. And then we're going to go, and we're going to have that fight, and when we're done, I'm going to tell you, 
Good job. Yeah. You won. Good job. I won. Well, maybe we're going to do this next time. Sure. I learned that. And to me, that is, an, that is an amazing skill to learn for anybody or for any artist because you need that energy. Yes. Because as artists, we need each other. Yes. We need each other, you know what I mean? A lot of people view that as, if I'm an artist, my competition is my enemy. But that's not the reality. They make you better, man. Exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? At some point, I want to sit with my competition. I'm going to tell them, look, you do something that I don't do. I want to learn that from you. Mm -hmm. And if there is no kindness between you and that person, that person is not going to give you anything. Sure. You know what I mean? And you might end up with a friend. You never know. So, like, friendly competition. It might sound like a cliche, but over there I really learned that it's actually important. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's interesting because what you mentioned, we often say the spirit, right? To mm -hmm. have the spirit of being humble in winning and humble yes. in losing. But you said it's a skill. And mm -hmm. it's true because you can actually develop that. Exactly. Yeah. It's something you can choose to actively exactly. have that spirit. Exactly. You might not be good at it at mm -hmm. the beginning. It might be against your nature, but you can develop it. Very it's true. really That's interesting. Because you said you need to be self-aware. Mm -hmm. And if you're self-aware, once you get an emotion, dissect that emotion. Mm -hmm. and take a step back and go like, why do I feel jealous right now? Mm -hmm. Think about it. You're going to go like, maybe I feel jealous because one, two, three, maybe I feel like this person is going to take an opportunity from me that I want. Maybe this person is going to look better than I do in front of the camera. Yes. And then when you think about these things, you're just going to realize that it's not really a big deal. You know what I mean? So being self-aware is important. So yes, it is a skill because it's something that you need to go back to. Mm. You need to have a checklist. Why am I feeling this way? Whatever the feeling is. Why am I feeling happy right now? It's because of one or two, three. So you can actually recreate this experience and be happy more, more times than often. Mm. You know what I mean? A lot of people say, man, I don't know why I'm feeling this way. It's, it's because you don't take a step back and actually try to like, get the strands of those feelings out and try to understand why am I feeling this way? What, what happened before then? What do, what do I feel is going to happen after if I remain in that? Yeah, you got to take the time. You got to go through it. Exactly. It's painful. Exactly. It because you're not going to like the answers at the beginning. Exactly. But it's necessary. Yes. It's very necessary. And no one can do it for you. It's like a push up. Man, because you're the, you're the only one here, and you're the only one here. You know what I mean? People can perceive things, but you're the only one that's actually generating these emotions mm. and these thoughts. Mm. So, yeah, being self aware, that's, that's very important. Was there anything that you learned while you were there in terms of tips, advice that you were given that you felt was critical to you winning? Uh, yes, there were actually a lot, especially on stage. Mm -hmm. Again, for people who, who want to sing and even for people who, who like speak, sure. uh, you divide your attention mm -hmm. because you're on TV. It's not just the people, yes. it's the people and the cameras. Yes. So you need to divide your attention. Sometimes you need to pay, to pay attention to where the red dot is, on which camera. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to deliver a certain word, you want to look at the camera and say it. Because just as there are, let's say, 500 people on that stage, there are millions watching. So you want to connect with those people That's too. That's right. You know what I mean? And with the judges as well. You want to pay attention to them. If it's a happy song, smile. If it's a sad song, make that expression. Enjoy the song. Like, even physically, be yes. expressive. Yes. I learned that a lot over there. Because from what I've seen from the people and from watching myself again. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as we're done with the show on Friday, we run to the hotel to watch the rerun. I don't do that with the guys. For some reason, I don't like it. I like to watch the whole show by myself. Yes. You know what I mean? I, I want to criticize myself. But they always like to sit down after the show and watch the whole thing and go like, yeah, I messed up here. No, I should have done that there. So I learned that doing mm -hmm. that. And going back and watching the things and understanding that when I'm on stage, the attention is on me. So I need to give it back. Yes. You know what well I mean? Well said. I, I, I need to look at the people. Sometimes I need to look directly into somebody's eyes. That's right. And, and deliver that emotion. Because mm. at the end of the day, they might go home and go like, wow, that moment was intense. Mm. Especially if somebody's nervous. 
That is a technique that I learned. If, if I was on stage and I'm nervous because people are looking at me, I would look at somebody and make them nervous. <laughs> Here's the hedgehog. Here you go. Exactly. Take it. You don't like it, do you? You, know? <laughs> you do that. You, you, you give it back. And then, actually, sometimes when you see the discomfort in somebody, when you look at them, you go like, okay, now you know how I feel. And it boosts, but like it gives you more confidence. Yeah. Like, okay, I made that person feel nervous. Sometimes if you make somebody else feel nervous, it makes you feel more confident. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know it sounds evil. <laughs> so sad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, like, so sad. You know, when you do that sometimes, and you understand that you reflect the emotion. You sure. mirror the emotion. Yeah. You see somebody that's smiling, and you smile back. But when you do that, it's not only that person that's seeing you smile. It's everybody else in that place. And you try to reflect that. And sometimes you go on, on a stage where you are so powerful that people are going to mirror you. Mm. But sometimes you're going to be in a situation where you're going to mirror the people. Yes. So you need to be strong enough to switch that. Yes. You know what I mean? Like you're going to go into a place where the AC was not working the whole time, so everybody's just sitting there. It's like, got nothing to do with you. Yeah, nothing to do with you. It's just too hot, mate. Too exactly. Hot. Yeah. And you go on stage and you just see everybody just uncomfortable. You go like, man, how can I switch that? Mm. And then you try to find those techniques to switch that. It, but you can even comment about it. They're like, man, it's hot in here, right? You know yeah. what I mean? So when people go like, hey, oh yeah, he's feeling what I feel. Yeah, yeah, it is. You know what I mean? That's when they pay attention to That's you. That's right, yes. And then you grab their attention and run with it. It's interesting mm. because what you've mentioned are techniques that I share mm. as a public speaking coach. Yeah. Like, there is an elephant in the room. It's hot. Well. Say it, don't Let's act like it's it. all okay. Exactly. It's not okay, it's Let's hot. <laughs> exactly. We, we did an interview where there was issues with the rooms or bits mm. and pieces and we weren't sure whether we were gonna be able to do the whole yeah. interview or not. Mm. And most people, or maybe the younger version mm. of me, would be like, okay, well, let's just run with it, and then when it happens, it happens. Mm. And then we'll try to explain it to the, to the guests there, there and then. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, Matt, yeah, yeah, I get it. You, you get to a point in life, or hopefully you get to a point in life sooner than later, mm. where you're just comfortable in your own skin. Exactly. Before we even started, I was like, hey, things for whatever reason hasn't panned out. Mm. At any moment, we could get kicked out. Yeah. So just so you know, in case this interview is cut short. Let's be ready. We're going to go and get coffee and croissants. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be the worst case scenario. We'll just have to reschedule. I mean, it didn't happen. Mm. But I think the fact that we were just so yeah. open about it. Yeah. Yeah. We had it. We just laughed about it. Like it, it creates a connection. Yes. Like, instead of you just sitting thinking about it like, man, somebody is going to come and kick us out. This person does not know what is that going to do. You know, just let it out. Let that person know. Hey, Somebody's going to kick us out. Yes, <laughs> true. And what you said about dividing attention and giving it back, mm. that's powerful. I mean, we say the eyes are the windows to the soul. Yeah, exactly. And I see far too many people, also artists, mm. not just professionals who are yeah. communicating or speaking, they've got their head down in the notes. Yes. I'm like, buddy, no one wants to see you read. Exactly. Or right? they got shades on, especially artists. Yeah. It's part of the style. I got shades on. But people were not, are not going to connect with you. And it depends. Sometimes you're going to go up on stage and they're going to perform a couple of songs that are very upbeat and they do not require that personal connection. Yes, Yes. okay, put your shades on as a, as a singer. Cool. But if you have a song where it's very emotional That's right. and you yeah. want people to understand yes. it, no, you got to be candid. 100%. If, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, that's cool. That's the whole point. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Even if people see that you're uncomfortable singing that song, if you express that emotion yes they're gonna feel you either way and when you're off stage they're gonna come to you and gonna go like man i really love that song maybe it's not the song it's the connection yes that they felt you know? it reminds me of something you said about um how today we live in a world where things you know you take so many takes when you go into the recording mm. studio there's auto tune there's takes yeah, you can yeah. you can get it to a place of perfection and you like the thing about the 70s and 80s is because it was all one take, one take. you could hear the imperfections one and if take. I'm quoting you correctly you said it's in the imperfections that makes the song so perfect. Exactly, exactly. because every, everybody sounds the same right now mm. because but they're, they're taking the same amount of takes, uh, but they have auto-tune on the voice and I have nothing against auto-tune, I use it mm -hmm. because it adds a flavor sure. sometimes to some of the songs. But when you listen to, to the old songs, the soul songs, especially from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 
You can actually, as a singer, when you listen to it, you can actually hear um, they did not hit that note perfectly. But I like it. Yes. You know, I like it for some reason. That's exactly why I like yes. it. So yeah, it isn't the imperfection, yeah. because that's what makes us different, I believe. Especially in this day and age when everyone's seeking perfection, when everyone has the same tools and they're all doing the same things. The fact that you stand out. Man, and social media <laughs> is not helping with that. <laughs> Look how perfect I am. Exactly. Look at my perfect life. Look at what I'm doing and all of that. That's cool. Yeah. And I get it. And it's extremely difficult to, to choose to show anything imperfect on yes. social media. I'm very understanding of that. But at the same time, you know what? It's life. Yes. You know, that's, that's, that's what's going to make you different. I'm going to just go in a completely different direction. Hopefully, mm -hmm. you'll find the thread to come back to it. <laughs> um, just since we were talking about perfection and um, you wanted initially to have your audition on a CV. Mm. At this stage that you are today, your CV is fantastic. I mean, da 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 mm. it's, it's all greatness, mm. right? And in 20 years, it'll be even bigger and, mm. you know, until, you know, the, the, the highest peaks of wherever yes. you go. But the problem is, for aspiring artists, mm. for newbies, for people who are lost, for yeah. let's say for example for myself, if I want to venture into something new, mm -hmm. and I look at someone like Hamza Hausawi, and I look at his CV, mm. and I just see X Factor winner, release mm. these songs, done this, collaboration with brands, speaks you know, here, mm. does events here, it's overwhelming. There is mm. a scientist, her name escapes me, but I'm gonna mention it in the credits, and we're, we're gonna put mm. the link to it. Um, where there's a concept of CV of failures. Oh, and, and the idea behind it is for every single one of us, mm. like today I'm a public speaking coach to world leaders and CEOs, mm. but buddy, that one line on my hypothetical CV has got 10,000 lines behind it of the number of times that I was um, disappointed, mm. rejected, yeah. um, that they said no to me, that they went with the competition, they didn't think I was good enough the heartaches, all yes, the things that yes. I face for that one line that looks really good. Mm. What would be some of the things that would be in your hypothetical CV of failure? Some of the things that would be there. I'm in just the hope that whoever is watching this, whoever is listening, can go, it's not all just sunshine. It's not. It rains. It's not. Even in a city like Dubai, it does rain sometimes. One of the biggest stages that I've performed in was in Riyadh, Saudi okay. Arabia. Riyadh. Yes. And it was, it was spanning through three days. And every day we had 50,000 people wow. coming in. So it's a lot of people who came in, mm -hmm. no tickets, it's an open event. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine it's all walks of life, yes. not just somebody who's willing to sit there and listen to you sing in English. I got booed all three days. Oh, that's not easy, man. Three days. That's that's not, that's not fun at all. Not at all. Not at all. But the first day, it was a surprise. The second day, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna enjoy this. I'm, I'm gonna enjoy it, I'm gonna take that. There were a lot of people that were enjoying it. But yes. at the same time, when you see the negative, it stands it out. You. Yes. You get 50 comments that are, oh, good job, nice, amazing. And then that's one, that one comment that says, yeah, man, that, that was awful. You're like... It's amazing how much weight we give it. Exactly. Yeah. That was, that was huge for me because that was like, my biggest audience. Three days, if you add that up, that's 150,000 people. Yes. It's one of the biggest stages that I've ever been on in my life. But when I share it... When I share that experience on social media, you're only gonna see me have fun on stage. That's right. You're not gonna hear the boom. Yes. But that really gave me the courage to go like, you know what, on any stage that I go, even if I face that, I'm gonna have a good time. And I'm gonna make sure that whoever's there to see me and have fun is gonna see me and have fun and not gonna see me be affected by that. But I cannot tell you that I did not go back and go like, damn, that was heavy. Yes. Sitting with the band, I'm like, guys, what was that? Like, yeah, we felt it. And so what's the thought process? Because this is not easy to be on stage and to be booed. I mean, that's, that's the rejection. That's ultimate rejection. I guess exactly. that's when people say you have a fear of stage or fear of public speaking. That's probably it in reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And so you're facing it. You've mentioned it a couple of times, have fun. Mm. But yes. is there anything else that goes through your head? Or was, was this something that you've had to actively develop? Or I, was it just in your nature growing it, up? It's a, it's a really fast thought process. But I think about, okay, am I doing anything wrong? Mm. Is there a reason for the doing? Is it me personally? Is it just that they don't like this style of songs? Mm -hmm. And it's very fast, it's a checklist, real quick. Seconds. Yeah, and then I scan. Whoever is having fun, that's where I direct my attention. Yes, that's it. yes. This is a huge tip mm. because often professionals, when they're communicating, whether it's a presentation of five people or standing up on stage like you and you're, yeah. you're talking, you know, you're, you're singing to 50,000 people, mm. we make the mistakes like the likes on social media where we let that one person affect us so much when there's 49,000 people having fun. Exactly. And one of the things I, I tell my clients, I go, hey, focus. That mm. person, if, it's got nothing to do with you. Don't think so highly of yourself mm. thinking that it's you. It's not personal. It's not personal. They mm. could have had a bad day. They could be constipated. They could have just been <laughs> out of the job. Yeah, there could be so many reasons. Like they could have just had a breakup. It has nothing to do with you. The fact that you think so highly of yourself that mm. you are the cause of them not being happy, that that's just, you're true. egotistic. That is very Right? True. Focus on the 49,000 people who are having fun. Exactly. Which is interesting, it's something you do. Exactly. Well, that's why you're a class artist. And it's, it's very amazing that it actually goes back to ego, just like you said. Mm. You know what I mean? If you take that personally, then you need to check your ego. Yeah. That person does not know you. They don't know who you are. They don't know the kind of like life that you had or whatever it is or what you had to go through to go on that stage. Just like you said, maybe they had a breakup. Yep. Maybe they're just not having a good day. Sure. Maybe they just feel like, you know what, I'm mad, I want to make somebody else mad. Yep. You know? So yeah, that's true. It's, it's, it is about ego. You go back to that and you go like, you know what, this is not personal. Mm. I just got to do what I got to do. If I am on stage, if somebody asked me to come here and do this, let me at least do it for that person. Yes. At least. Yes. You know what I mean? Who, who really believed in me enough to go like, I want you to go on that stage because I believe that you're going to do something good. Mm. Unless they want to set me up or something. <laughs> Friends playing jokes. Exactly. As an artist, and you know, whoever's watching and listening to this, they could be doing, you know, because an artist, there is a million ways to be an artist. That's true. But as a singer, I guess, as a singer songwriter, for many, it's a goal to have a record label. Mm. And correct me if I'm mistaken in my research, but you were given a record label, and mm. when it's most people's dream to get a record label, you mm. decided to let go of that in order yes. to be able to... Do it independently. Do it independently. Mm. Take us through that thought process. When everyone's vying for a record mm. label, you're given one. Yeah. And you're willing to let it go. I truly do believe that record labels... I, I may be mistaken. I may be mistaken, but it's, it's like common knowledge between all artists that record labels made sense at some point, but right now they don't. Because what is the main goal of a record label? Is to put you out there. That's right, accessibility, distribution, exactly. that was the point, right? But now we have YouTube, we have Instagram, we have all these platforms where people actually became extremely famous from their bedroom. That's right. They did not need a record label. Number two, a, a, a record label is going to facilitate a studio for you. They're going to take you to these bigger studios and they're going to record uh, with, with amazing musicians and all of that. But right now, you can go to Virgin Megastore and buy a mic, buy a sound card, and record at home. And you can have relatively kind of the same quality. That's right. People will not pay attention to that. Some of the best artists that I listen to, I listen to their bad mixes. Yeah. They're really bad mixes, but I listen to that because I like the artist, I like the song, I like the lyrics, I like the chord progression. So I don't feel like the, the sound quality is affecting my experience. Yes. Another thing that record labels do, they, they connect you with other businesses. But again, we have social media. That's right. In social media, everybody's going to contact you. If somebody wants to do business with you, they're going to send you a message. That's right. So when a record label comes in and they tell you, we're going to do these things that you can do by yourself and we're going to take 70% out of everything that you make, that's not very appealing. Not at all. I don't want to do that. Now, granted, they might speed up the process. Mm -hmm. 
whatever you're gonna do in 10 years, they might do it for you in five. But if you're patient enough, you can do that yourself. You can have your own team and do that yourself. Uh, a record label is gonna make things very comfortable for you. Mm. You can be at home, just sitting, and they're gonna call you up and tell you, we got five songs ready for you, written, ready, just come record them and go back home. We have this music video ready for you, just come here, stand over here, sing, and go back home. They make things very easy and very comfortable for you. Mm. But as an independent artist, you need to do all that by yourself. Sometimes you need to write the songs by yourself, or you need to actually look and scout for people who write. And you need to look for the musicians. Mm. You might find a musician, like you, in one song you want to have a guitar solo. You get a guitarist and you don't like what they do and you need to look for somebody else. Sure. You need to go and shout for other things. You need to style yourself. A record label is going to style you. you so the question is, do you want to handle all the moving parts? Exactly. Or do you want it handled for you? And they're going to take most of the cake. Sure. Or you want to do it yourself and get all of the cake. And you choose the team that is going to share that cake with you. Sure. And you get limited creativity. Exactly. I was going to say, exactly. would you, was, was, that's, was that's, the limitation on creativity I think also? that's one of the most important points. Factors, yeah. yeah. The creative process. You literally said it out. I was just about to come out of my words. <laughs> He's very process. much into music, yeah. Yeah? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the creative process because my experience with that record label is, uh, by the way, I'm a songwriter. Yes. Amazing. But we have these songs already ready for you. Come, sing those songs. You know what I mean? By the way, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a producer and I know a couple of producers. Amazing. <laughs> but we have these songs coming, you know what I mean? Yes. And they take the lead in everything that's creative, and they have the authority to tell you, no, we don't like that. Mm. You feel like in this music video, I want to wear a suit. I want to show that side of me. And they're like, no, that's not how we see you. You need to wear so-and-so, whatever it is. It might be appealing to a lot of people, but to you, you wouldn't feel like it reflects who you are. Sure. So being independent, it's not easy. Sure. Because you're gonna have you're gonna have to choose your own team. You're gonna have to go through a lot of people that are that that won't be good for you. Of course. And I had I had to do that. I went through that. I, I worked with a lot of people that by the end of two years I was like, you really did not benefit me at all. And two years have like flown by. That's I need right. I need to move on. You know what I mean? A record label will do that for you. They will make sure that somebody over there getting paid a salary is going to make sure that you're going to do your thing. From, from the experience you've had, if you're looking for people today, knowing what you know today, mm. what filters do you have now in place to save yourself time? Because, I mean, this is a challenge mm. we face recruiting anybody. Yes. Video editor, mm. uh, sound engineer, lyricist, mm. <laughs> someone to help you with marketing, PR. He's your brother, right? He's my brother, yeah. He's doing it. That's it. It's somebody that you trust. Somebody that you know. But somebody that is close to you most of the time. What if they don't have the capacity though? Because not everyone that's close to you has the capacity. That is true. But I truly do believe that you have a lot of people around you with skills that you can utilize. Mm. You just got to choose to be resourceful. Exactly. Like a friend of mine who was, uh, I knew that guy for 10 years. He was one of my closest friends. And I was like, I really want that person on my team. How would I do that? But then I realized that he's a salesman. And I'm like, I'm a product. Sell me. Mm. And that worked. I have another friend of mine who is, uh, for example, a friend of mine who's an architect. And I'm like, all right, that person is going to help me when it comes to the stage. That person is going to help me when it comes to how I want things to look. That person is gonna help me, like if I'm speaking to somebody and they tell me we have a stage plan, I was like, send me the stage plan and I'll show it to them. Like, what do you think? Does this make sense? Mm. You know what I mean? So we have all these people. It around. requires you to be visionary. Exactly. Like you need to For see you to put the pieces. Exactly. And some, sometimes you're just gonna see somebody who's good at one thing and what you need to do is help them develop that. So then they can be a part of the team. Interesting. You get what I mean? You see somebody who is actually very good socially. Mm -hmm. They're not doing anything. They just like, they have a they have a desk job, for example. But whenever you're in a social setting, that person is like 
amazing. Like he talks to people. He's like there's a connector. Good. Yeah. And you go like, you know what? I want you to be my manager. Or you know what? I have this event and I want to connect with so many people, but I can't. Here are a couple of my business cards. Let's go and let's connect. Yes. And that person can be your PR. You know what I mean? If you give them the right tools and you direct them to the right direction, you're going to build that skill enough to the point where you both are going to work on this thing mm. and he's going to benefit or she's going to benefit and you're going to benefit as well. Well said. These are gems, man. Yeah. What yeah. you're saying is like, like real gems. Mm. So it's, I truly do believe that it's, it needs to be somebody that you trust because I keep seeing it with a lot of artists. Mm. And when I go back into the behind the scenes or stuff like that, I see their managers. And when they talk about it, they're like, oh yeah, he's been my friend ever since we were kids. We used to be in the same hood together. We used to be in the same school together. And then I see a lot of artists who just got introduced to a manager and then they end up in court and stuff like that. Sometimes it works out. Sure. Sometimes, even if it's somebody who's close to you, it doesn't work out. It happens. Sure. You know what I mean? All these possibilities can happen. But I feel like it's safer and it makes more sense to have somebody that there is a personal connection yes. with. You know what I mean? At some point, there is a job where there is no contract. You're going to trust working with that person more than somebody who you do not know, or somebody who just came in into the business part. So you're a gut and in, like an intuition kind of person. Big time. Yeah? Big time. Big time. I truly do believe that you need to trust your gut feelings. That's there for a reason. But not a lot of people actually get that. Like at some point I did not understand what is the idea of a gut feeling. Sure. I didn't get it. And I was struggling because I keep hearing it and I'm like, but what is it? What is it? Mm. But then I realized that in the beginning it's, it's the first thought. It's the first thought that comes to your That's mind. That's right. And it's going to nag in your mind for two seconds and then it's gone whether you respond or you don't. It's up to you to cultivate that. Exactly. And if you respond in these two seconds, it's like your gut is going to go like, oh, you trust me. Cool. Next time I'm going to keep that thought for four seconds. Yes. And if you don't listen, they're like, oh, you don't trust me anymore. I'm going I'm to dial back to two seconds. And then at some point, your gut feeling is just going to nag. It's going to be there for 10 minutes. <laughs> Look, hey, don't do it. Or trust me, go ahead. You know what I mean? And then once you go into the, the, the stage where your gut feeling is actually what drives what you do, sometimes you're going to mess up. We're human. Sure. It doesn't mean that all your gut instincts are going to lead you into the right direction. But I, I truly do believe that when you respond to your gut feeling, there is less, way less regret. Mm. Even if things didn't work out, you're like, you know what? I really went by what I felt. It didn't work out, that's cool, I'm gonna learn from that. Mm. But when it's just the thought process and when you go through your emotions and try to figure out the things emotionally, yes. that's where regret resides. 100%. Yeah. You mentioned learn. Mm. You're in circles with a lot of great people. Mm. What would be some of the things you've learned perhaps in the last few years? Mm. So, you know, you're hanging out with you know, artists, celebrities, yeah. you know, top producers. Uh, great minds, yes. great achievers, mm. and by the sounds of it, you're an observer. Yes. You see something, oh, that person does it, I'm going to try that. Absolutely. That word, I'm going to use it. Mm. What have you observed? What have you noticed that you feel are things that you've learned to save you from having to experience and you know, bang your head against the wall? Because mm. granted, there are some lessons we all have to just bang our heads against the wall. That is true. But if you're smart, mm. <laughs> sooner or later you go, I don't have to do this for every lesson. That is very true. I truly do believe that, and, and I really like the fact that when I sit with people, I always ask questions. Yes. And I try to understand their experiences and the things that they went through, whether they're good or bad, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to business. So there are things that I see where people get into a job and they don't understand the full scope of things. Mm -hmm. But they just feel like, you know what, this, this is going to be good for me. And then it backfires. Especially when it comes to things that have to do with contracts. Sure. If you want to get into the details. A lot of people feel like, you know what, this, is, this looks too good to be true. And this is so, if something looks too good to be true, 
Maybe it is. 100%. You know what I mean? Yeah. One of the main things that I learned is just be safe. When it comes to dealing with people, when mm -hmm. it comes to dealing with business and things like that, go in with your personality, go in with your energy. It yes. doesn't mean that you need to omit something. It doesn't sure. mean that you need to come in with a different character or a different personality. But at the same time, you need to be careful with every situation that you go into. Yes. And anything that might resemble a red flag, address it. Yes. That is what I learned because I see a lot of people, like when they see a red flag in something, when they it comes to business or personal, personal or whatever, they do pay attention. They see it. Their gut feeling is like, hey. But they go like, no, 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 that's fine. I, I, I'm not going to respond to that. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just overthinking. Maybe it's not really what it seems like. Mm. But you need to pay attention to that either way. Even if it turns out not to be a red flag, yes. it's just going to signal to the other person in front of you that you're attentive. and you're That's actually, right, you're on point. Yeah, you're paying attention. Yes. And they're either going to respect that, and they're going to feel like, yeah, this is a person I can work with, or they're going to feel like, oh, he called my bluff. I'm not sure I can do that. Because you, know? mm. you never know intentions. You mentioned this as uh, earlier on with artists in terms of, say, getting paid, right? 50% mm. on booking, 50% before I go on stage. Yes. One of the things I learned early on, um, I was given this advice by um, yeah, an older, more experienced person mm. right at the beginning of my career. He, he goes, for your line of work as mm. a motivational speaker, as someone who wants to, who's just building a business around himself and a brand mm. because you know, he was clear about, I shared with him my vision or what I wanted that's to do. A, that's a tough way to do it. But yeah. yeah. Mm. He, um, he said, get paid before you start. Mm. And so without just keeping my personality, keeping my thing, and this is my recommendation for everyone, mm. you have to be willing to walk away from the deal if it doesn't go through the parameters. That so now, and for many years, we've, we've done this. Mm. Would you like to book Kevin? Yes. The date available, excellent. In order to confirm the booking, payment must be made in full. Whether you're a mm. government agency, whether you're a royalty, mm. whether you're a Fortune Corporate. 500 companies, mm. whether you want to give exposure, whatever your line is, it doesn't mm. matter. Yes. Unless the payment is not made, that date is not booked in the calendar. Yes. Have we lost deals? Very few. Mm. But I was very clear that I don't have a team or I don't want to even spend the energy of having to hire someone to chase up on yes. people. Yes. And you know what? By just having these parameters and the business lesson that I received, I was like, mm. this saves me a lot. A lot. And it's been fantastic. A lot of time as well. Yes. I, I truly do believe that it has something to do with the abundance mindset. Yes. Big time. It has a lot to do with the abundance mindset because you know what? If things don't go the same way I really feel like they should, yes. you're not being extra. It's just something that's going to guarantee what I do, sure. and it's going to guarantee you that I'm going to go on stage and deliver to the fullest. Yes. If it doesn't work, I don't mind losing it. Sure. It's, it's really the abundance mindset. Yes. Because people try to chase those things going like, oh, what if I don't get it? That scarcity mindset yes. is just, it sets you back. Yes, well said, well said. I can't remember where I saw this, but um, I got it while I was doing mm. some research. Uh, you don't know their names, you don't know what they were saying, yet you were influenced by them. And I'm referring mm. to French rappers that Hamza Hausawi <laughs> used to listen to. Yes. Um, how do they connect? Because I want to relate this to the title of your TEDx talk, mm. which was the language of music. Yes. And how through the language of music, everyone can connect regardless yeah. of our culture. Yes. And language. And I think I understood that because it was in Arabic. Yeah. And even yeah, though my Arabic yeah. isn't so strong, so I did pretty okay. That was a very interesting story. That day so please do tell, because I don't think there is an English version, and this would be yeah, great. Yeah, for sure. That was a very, very, very interesting story. Now, I was at the studio in Saudi, in Jeddah, with uh, one of the greatest producers that I ever sat with. His name is Faraz Shatila. Mm -hmm. And he had this project that was fusion. He would go to the desert and bring the people that were living in the desert, singing their songs for generations and generations, people that have not ever seen the city, mm. brings them into the studio, and they're yeah, like, just chant, whatever you chant when you're uh, like sitting next to your tent or whatever, when you're sitting with your family or in your weddings or whatever it is, I just want you to chant it and I will record it. 
So he used to go to different parts of Saudi to do that. And when we were sitting in the studio, it's a big studio with a lot of employees, international employees. So he played one of those songs for me. And it was this guy chanting in, in a certain way that I don't even remember, but it's very, very unique and it's very distinct. We were listening to it, listening to the music, and then suddenly one of the Spanish guys that was there working, he walked in. And he had this look on his face like he was extremely surprised. He's like, what is this? What are you guys playing? And he told him, he explained to him, it's, uh, it's, it's a traditional song like extremely traditional, not the traditional that we hear today. More like this is something that has to do with a village and it has to do with a, with a certain tribe. In Saudi Arabia? Yes. So that guy was like, please stop for a second. And we stopped the music. What is it? He took his phone out. He was scrolling. And then he went into uh, the voice notes. And he played a voice note. And that voice note, there was a lady singing exactly the same thing that we were listening to on those speakers. Exactly the same thing, the same notation, the same runs in the vocals, maybe even the same scale. We were just sitting there like, what is this? Like, is this the a cappella of this? What is it? He's like, this is my grandmother in Spain. She never left Spain. She doesn't have a radio. She doesn't have TV. She doesn't have any of those things. And this is a song that she used to sing to us as kids. And wow. she's old. And she was singing it in Spanish, and this guy was singing it in Arabic. But it's exactly the same song. And this guy has no TV or no radio. He's living in the desert. And this lady is an old lady with no TV or no radio. She's singing this song because she heard it from her grandmother and her grandmother before her. And like, if you go back into history, you will understand the connection. You know what I mean? Because uh, the, the Islam empire was in Spain mm. at some point in history. But initially, when you see something like that, you go like, how did that connection occur? How did that happen? And then you understand that it's, it's just music. Man. Like, when I listen to those French rappers, I don't know what they're saying. But when I listen to it, I just like the melody. I like the flow, and it resonates with me. Mm. And maybe at some point, subconsciously, I will be in the studio writing a song, and I'm going to be inspired by that same thing that I heard from those French rappers. And somebody else 10 years from now is going to listen to the song and go like, wow, it's the same. But this person is from a different place. Well, right now, with the existence of all these technologies, yes. we're actually becoming one person. We're becoming one, like, uh, one hive mind. Interesting. Because we're sharing all these information yes. together. Yes. And that's actually creating kind of like one personality, you know what I mean? But seeing that situation, I was like, it's very interesting how we're connected through music. And that experience, like, I feel like it affected that guy for good because he was in shock the whole night after. In his mind, how did that connection happen? How, how is this possible? I'm all the way from home in Saudi, in a place where even my friends over there think that I'm riding a camel right now. That's right. That's how that's they think. That's the perception. Yeah, sure. that's how they think about it. And then he's like, I'm listening to this song, and it's something that I grew up listening to mm. in Spain. And to me, that, that changed a lot of things in the way that I think when it comes to music. Because I know for sure that music is should be eternal. Yes. And when I work on songs, the way that I think about it is I really want the song to stand the test of time. If I just want to make a song that's going to be a hit in the radio for a month and it's gone, okay, maybe that's going to benefit me. Maybe that's going to get me a couple of shows. Maybe that's going to get me some money. But I'd rather have a song that 100 years from now people are still going to listen to. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, timeless. That, I always think about that. I really want to create something that is going to be timeless. You mentioned flow. Mm. How do you get yourself in a state of flow? This is, I ask mm. this specifically because it's easier if you're a methodical person. Maybe yes. you are. But like if you're an engineer type, it's easy. Yeah, yeah. But when you're creative, I mean, my mom jokes around. She mm. goes, do you work? I'm like, mom, I'm always working. You just, 
Your version of work is just very different. My yeah. version of work is sitting around in cafes looking like yeah. I'm not working, but I'm thinking. <laughs> thinking is working for Kev. Sure. Right? But coming back to you, the, the idea of flow, how do you, do you have a, a process? What's your perhaps rituals or habits to put yourself in a creative process? I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're singles. So maybe you can share with us how you mm. got inspired. Yes. And perhaps if you have a process for these, in the hope that you know, the viewer can go, hey, that's a good habit to have. Mm. Well, there are two parts to this. Sometimes I get inspired. Mm -hmm. If I'm watching a movie, yes. if I'm having a conversation with someone, and we mention something, and I'm like, that could be a nice song. And I just write down the note. Just from a comment. Yeah, I go like, that could, that could be a really nice song. And I write it down, and I go like, um, when I go to the studio, I'll try to create something out of it. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, I go into the studio, for example, with a producer, and we're listening to some music, and I listen to, to this song, and I feel like I want to write to this song. One second. It's one of those ideas that I was inspired by. You know what I mean? And I come up with, I take that idea and I try to apply it mm -hmm. onto that song. But that, like... So you do note-taking, a lot of yeah. note-taking, okay. But it's not something that you can depend on. Sure. Because sometimes you need to make sure that you're constantly creating. Yes. And that's, especially with music, you need to make sure that you're constantly creating. So... If I want to get into the, the one, two, three of it, mm -hmm. I go into the studio, mm -hmm. whether it's my home studio, whether it's on my laptop. Yes. Even if I'm at a cafe and I open the laptop and I put Warm my Warm studio, yep. Yeah. yeah. I go like, I want a song that is a beat. I just make a decision. It's just like uh, throwing a dice. Yes. I go like, I feel like I want a song that is a beat, a song that is happy. Mm -hmm. Then I look for the tempo. I'm like, I want the song to be 120 BPM, for example. And then I imagine what's going to happen on those clicks. It's going to be a kick and a snare. I have no idea what I'm doing, but yeah. I know You're that playing this, around. Yeah, I know that this is the skeleton mm -hmm. of the song. Mm. Then I go like, what instruments do I imagine on that? Is it a piano? Is it a guitar? Is it a pad? Is it a synth? Then I go like, let me look for other songs that have the same tempo. And I go and I look for other songs. And then I get inspired from those songs. I go like, okay, this song, they have the same thing. I really like the sound of the kick. I want to look for a kick that sounds just like that. Mm. Or I really like the chord progression and how it's going from this chord to this other chord, and then it goes back. Let me try and do something similar. And this is how I go through the, the creative process. And is this over a day? Is it over a span of a few days? Do you make a decision and you go, okay, I'm out for a month? Some songs I've written in four hours. Mm -hmm. Some songs, three years. Yeah. Sounds like my book writing process. <laughs> Just like writing a book. Yeah. You, you find Get inspired. Imagine if you could present yourself, your thoughts, and your ideas with clarity and confidence. Imagine if you could speak to influence and impact. Imagine if you could communicate like a commanding and charismatic leader. Well, you can, given the right information and the investment of effort from your end. How do I know that? As a public speaking coach, I work with CEOs, world leaders, and presidents. And when they hire me, they expect nothing short of results. And over the years, it's been two decades now, two challenges have risen for me being unable to help the majority of people. I'm usually on a plane, with the majority of my time being booked a good year or two in advance. And my one-on-one -on -one session to work with someone in person generally starts at $20,000. So we solved the problem by making my public speaking course available for you online. Everything that I teach my clients when I'm working one-on-one, -on -one, thoughts, tips, strategies, how to do things, all on video, all sequenced in the right order 
for you to be able to watch, re-watch, practice and refine your presentation, your speaking and your overall communication skills. And guess what? You will get results. Now, you can have this course not for the $20,000 that my clients pay me when we work one-on-one. -on -one. You can have it for $9.97. That's right, just $9.97. You might be thinking, well, why are you offering something that you charge $20,000 for, for $9.97? It's simple, because those who want to work with me one-on-one -on -one will still hire me. But for many whom I might be out of their budget, this is a great way to develop their communication skills, to cut through the noise, to rise above the rest, and to beat their competition. If you're serious about wanting to develop your skills, to be able to present your thoughts, your ideas, and yourself with clarity and confidence, to be able to speak, to influence and impact, and to communicate like a confident and charismatic leader, then this course is for you. Go on to kevinabdurrahman.org forward slash course and get started today. You know what I mean? Well, you know, I was telling my brother, my other brother yesterday, that um, I can use the excuse as a creative. Mm. Let's say if I, if I was to classify myself as a creative, I can use the excuse that, but I'm an artist. It mm. needs to come when it comes. Yeah, right? I'm waiting for inspiration. <laughs> I'm waiting for inspiration. Mm. And then I could be waiting for years and I've had yes. waited for mm. years. And then if I'm honest with myself, I see achievers mm. who are also creators. They're creators and achievers and mm. they've done a whole lot. Yeah. And what they have is they have certain habits yes. that bring about the inspiration because you can create habits that sets you off. Yes. For me, for example, a couple of double, double espressos sets me off. That's the ignition. Right? That's the ignition. Yeah. And I'm going, okay, that needs to be in the formula. Yes. Um, reading books by individuals I like, their writing styles mm. or listening to podcasts of individuals yes. whom I admire. Listening to that for about maybe 45 minutes or an hour, I start getting mm. juiced up. Yes. So I'm like, okay, I can put this together. I'm a slow starter. Mm. This is the reality of life. No one wants to admit it, yeah. but sooner or later we grow up and we, we better admit it. Yeah. I'm a slow starter. I'm mm. not a fast learner mm. or starter. I'm slow. It takes me two hours to warm up. Yeah. Okay, I gotta put that in. I say this is because over time when I'm honest and when I'm actually in a flow, mm. what I was telling my brother yesterday was my most productive time, let's say last year, was over a span of four weeks mm. where I picked one location. The building has a cafe, yeah. has a gym, has a couple of food outlets that serve healthy food. Oh, you spent and half a day there. Man. No, I did a lot more than that. And they're open from 7 a.m. to 3, 3 a.m. Mm. I literally found myself I put out three books in the space of five days. No way. Yeah. And in, sure. in four weeks, I created a training program. I recorded a training program. Mm. I did so much in those four weeks of not driving around, mm. canceling everyone, putting it, my phone on airplane mode. Because everything is around you. Because I created that atmosphere. Yeah. And then I went back to my normal way of living, which is unproductive. <laughs> but, but that's why I'm asking. But that, that is the location for you right now. It's not the location, but it's that setup. Yeah, yeah, yeah The setup it. of mm. wake up in the morning, airplane mode, mm. coffee's available, internet access yeah. for me to be able to listen to a podcast if or do some physical, reading. If you want to get physical, you have a gym. If I need to have a break because I'm fatigued, I go to the gym, which is important mm. for me. Food is around the corner. When I get fatigued mentally, I can just mm. step out, get some food, not have time wasted. So I'm not driving to a place to yeah, eat and driving exactly. back. That's an hour of wasted time. And I can stay there uninterrupted from hours. seven to four hours. Yeah, from seven to three in the morning, should mm. I wish. But many of the nights were still midnight. Mm. And I got so much done. I'm like, this is it. This right here is the formula. Now it's whether you choose to yeah, 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 live yeah. with this formula or not. Mm. And that's how this question came about was if there is a process that you found or. That's actually very true. Uh, making sure that everything you need is within its arm reach. That's very important. Yes. Because we always give ourselves the excuse of, man, I'm hungry right now. Maybe if I eat, I'm going to be able to create. Yeah. And then, <laughs> it's yeah. true. And then you leave and you get something to eat and all the way you get distracted. Or you catch up with a friend and go and eat, which exactly. is the, that's a terrible idea. Exactly. And sometimes you feel like, man, just like I said, I'm, I'm a bit fatigued. Let me go to the gym. Yes. I'll go to the gym. I'll just, you know, run for a little bit or just 
lift some weight and I'm gonna be back. And this time is wasted. Yes. But you're, tr you're right, when you have those things around you, when you create that setup. Yes. And you're like, everything that I need is here. I have no excuse. Like, but my mind is not gonna have me procrastinate right now. Yes. For no reason. That's when you juice up that uh, productive step in. Yes. Because you need that ignition. And sometimes. I feel like anyone can do it, especially in this day and age that we live in. Like, there's no excuse. I mean, internet is close to free. If you can't mm. afford data, wherever you sit has Wi Fi. That's true. Coffee is inexpensive. I mean, your thing could be tea or hot water. Mm. I don't know, whatever it is. <laughs> but, you know, you can create this thing. Mm. I mean, gyms these days, sure, there are membership gyms, but there are many true. gyms that are also free in just yeah. about any building. Yeah, you can just go in there. But it really just comes down to choice. Or you do the ghetto run, you do the seven, seven, seven day trial here, the seven day trial. Exactly. <laughs> the ghetto run. I like that. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, I'm talking about really being able to do that. Yeah. But that's very true. Now, I was watching an interview where, what's the name of the writer of uh, Game of Thrones? I don't know. Uh, what's his name? One J second. J -R -R is it J.J. Abrams? Uh, no. What name is that? J.J. Abrams is lost. Is it different? Yeah. He was, he was sitting down with Stephen King. Okay. Which is the, the horror writer. Yes. And they were talking about the same thing. So his name is George, right? Yeah, George. I think George was saying, and I, I want to watch that interview again just to make sure. I'm paraphrasing. I think George was saying, it takes me years to write. Mm. I don't write, but like, I don't just sit down and decide to write. It takes me years to get inspired to write something. But for Stephen King, he is constantly writing. Yes. Constantly writing. Whether he has an idea or not. He's constantly just trying to start that ignition. Mm. This is why he has so many books. Yes. And then, and then you have two different styles of very successful writers. Yes. A writer that takes a lot of time and waits for inspiration to happen. And you have that other writer that says, you know what? I have a habit. I am going to write either way. That's right. And something is going to work out from all... I just keep this. writing, exactly. absolutely. I'm just going to keep writing. And some, one of those pages is going to be nice. And I'm going to add it to something else. And I'm going to add it to something else. But so it's like, I mean, this requires patience and perseverance. Extremely. Extreme patience. Have you had that? Have you had to develop it? Because Not growing up, I wasn't patient. Not yet. Well, I, actually, I actually was forced into patience. Because... <laughs> Especially when it comes to music. You, l you learn to become patient. You get blocked. Okay. And you get that as a writer. It's actually the same process. Right. You get that as a writer. But if you let that frustrate you, that block is going to remain for a longer period of time. And, I mean, there is that block, but there's also the aspect of people giving up on their dreams. Oh, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Because our goals mm. are like, I want this by yeah. yesterday. Yes. Like, I'm always on yesterday's thing. But I shouldn't have been big enough. Exactly. They're like, oh, you've made it big. Well, you should have known about me 10 years ago, <laughs> damn it. I've been exactly. waiting on you. Where have you been? Where have you been? I've been waiting on <laughs> you. But what is the goal? I, tr I think about that sometimes. I, I sit with some people that tell me, if I didn't make it by this age, I'm just going to stop. But what is making it to you? Mm. Like, I truly do believe that you need to ask yourself that question as an artist or as a writer or in whatever you do. What is making it to you? A lot of people go like, well, making it to me is I want to get, uh, I want to be able to get a million dirhams uh, a year mm. as an income. But then that means you're not really loving the process because if you love the process, but then the, bit, the yeah. timeline of the whole aspect of time just mm. Vent. goes away. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. And some people, like, even the way that the idea of making it to them is like, when I go on stage, I want, if I decide that I want to invite everybody in my social media, I want 1,000 people to come and fill that stage for me. Mm. Some people have that in their mind as a goal. Sure. But again, it's all about the process, you know what I mean? But these things, they don't come easy, especially when it's a creative but when it's a creative business. Yes. When we're trying to create music or yes. create uh, 
training programs or create books. Yes. It, it's not really set with a timeline. Was there a defining moment in your mind where you go, okay, this is what I want to do, mm. and I'm willing to go through the sacrifice, I'm willing mm. to do whatever it takes, yes. and I'm willing to be patient. Do you remember that, that moment? Or go, you know, going through that process? I do remember that moment. And surprisingly, it's not really X Factor. It happened before that. Mm -hmm. But I was just frustrated because I did not have the tools to quit everything and just focus on that. But I knew that doing music is what I wanted to do. And I, and I knew that, you know what? I'm going to try to remember the exact moment. But I, I, think, I think it was one of the shows that I did, probably in France. I worked with uh, an artist called Qusay. Mm -hmm. He's a rapper in Saudi. And he's one of the people who I met in 2009. And he heard about me after 2008, mm -hmm. after my performances that happened then. And he was, he was still one of the biggest artists in Saudi or in the Middle East when it comes to rap. Arabic crap. And he used to give me a lot of opportunities to go with him on stage. I recorded with him in a couple of albums, and then we used to travel together to do a lot of shows in different places. And I think one of the shows that we did was in France. And I don't know why. There was nothing particularly special about that show. But it was that time where I was like, this is what I want to do. The, the closest chance that I get, I'm going to drop everything else. Whatever it takes. Yeah, and I'm just going to focus on that. And then X Factor happened. Mm. I think that time was in 2013. Mm. Two years later, X Factor happened. The reason I ask is because there are times where, and there are plenty of people, mm. I get a lot of DMs and I got a lot of emails and when I'm speaking on stage, mm. people come up and, and talk. And everyone, there are plenty of people with dreams, passions, yeah. things they want to do. Whether it's a new idea, it's an entrepreneurship, or within, you know, they want to be a great lawyer yeah. in any aspect, but they don't take the step. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or they want to take the step, but they just want the mm. glitz and glam. Kev, mm. I want to be a motivational speaker. Good for you. Mm. Are you willing to put in the sacrifice? Yeah. Are you willing to have your patience tested? Mm. Are you willing to handle a lot of the moving parts mm. like but you would you managing a label? This? How do you deal with those things? I put it back on the person. Mm. I'm like, go and ask yourself these questions because nine times out of 10, these individuals mm. who are asking these questions, I want to be a motivational speaker. Mm. I want to become a singer. Yeah. I want to win. I want to do this. They haven't asked the question, what am I willing to do mm. to get to it? Some of them, maybe they don't even know the kind of things that they need to do. But what would you tell them? Like if you see somebody with actual potential, mm. What do you warn them about? I tell them, try out so, as many things until you figure out what it is you want. Exactly. Mm -hmm. right? Try it out. Yeah. And then ask yourself, if this is what I want to do, am I willing to do whatever it takes? Like mm -hmm. for me, when I, I was very clear, this is the path I'm going to take. Mm -hmm. I'm going to become a top motivational speaker mm -hmm. where people call in and say, we're not asking for a tenor. We want this guy, Kevin yeah. Abdurrahman, to come to our event. Is he free? That's the only question. What's the mm. fee? Doesn't matter, it's six figures. We want him. Mm. Boom. That was the end goal. I want to be a public speaking coach, not to everyone, just to CEOs, world leaders, and royalty and presidents. Mm. Okay, what does it take? It requires you to do A, B, C, and D. Mm. What are the sacrifices? It means that you won't be able to hold the family down. Mm. Like you won't be able yeah. to find a wife who's going to be accepting mm. of being away 330 days of the year. Yes. You won't be able to, I can barely keep a cat. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but I think yeah. about that, I swear to God. You know, these are realities, I right? I can't, I can't be a yeah. great friend. So because you're not going to be around I can't, a lot of the time, I can't, right? I'm honest, I'm not a great friend. The best mm. that I could do as a friend, I was asked this a few months ago, mm. are you a good friend? I said no, and the person was surprised. I'm mm. like, I'm honest about it. I'm not a good friend because a good friend will be there for you when you need him mm. or her. Yeah. I'm not that kind of guy. The best that I could be, the best quality I have as a friend to you, is to let you be yourself. Mm. These are heavy realizations. But, and it requires you to go through this because that clarity will help you figure out what you want to do. Because asking these questions, I'm mm. like, okay. Man, I've had sleepless, uh, 
I'm not only sleepless nights, mm. I've gone hungry because of mistakes I made and then I was back to zero finances and I was not willing to give up. Been there. Yeah, I was not willing to give up, so I've, I went hungry. I was homeless mm. for so long. Yeah. I went through, I lost my ego. I had like, some of my friends looked down upon me, mm. you know, older friends. My brothers were going, what the hell are you doing, Kev? Yeah. Like, go and get a job and get six figures in mm. as a consultant. And at that point, my ego, no, I'm, I'm like the stubborn dog on yeah. a bone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I'm not letting go. Right? I, mean, I want to keep this. Yeah, there's stupid, stubborn, and smart stubborn. Yeah. I mean, I'll change a few things <laughs> if I could go back in time. But that requires clarity that and be true. willing to make mm. the sacrifice. What sacrifice have you been willing to make? Or you've but made? Most, most of the things that you mentioned, you actually made me realize them as well. It's like for a lot of people, I'm not around. Like if. Uh, if there is a phrase that I hear a lot of the time is, man, it's been a while. <laughs> I hear that a lot from a lot of people. Yeah. It's been a while. Wh where are you? What are you doing? I realize that when I go back and I meet people, it's just like, it's mostly just reminiscing. Mm -hmm. Because I'm always away. Yes. You know what I mean? And everybody's just doing their thing and I'm doing my thing, but then we reconnect again. You, you, you lose a lot of people. Sure. Because some people understand that. Yes. They're okay with it. They're understanding that you're going to be away and then you're going to come back. But a lot of them, they take it personally. Yes. And I don't blame them. Yes. That's just who they are. And you get to a point where you feel like, man, I really did not want to lose that person. But it's just, it just, it happened because it comes with, with the business that we're in. It comes with the lifestyle mm. and with the passion that we choose to pursue. Sure. It reminds me of that Dr. Seuss quote. Mm. Um, those who care don't matter. And those who matter don't <laughs> And those right? who matter is don't it? care. Or is it the other way around? Those who... Those who... Don't care. Don't, don't care. Matter. No, those who care don't matter. <laughs> God, I, I butchered Dr. <laughs> Seuss's quote. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Seuss. Those who don't, don't mind don't matter, and those who matter don't mind. Oh, where yeah. did I get care from? <laughs> those who mind don't matter. Mm and those who matter don't mind. Yes. How have you had to change, or have you had to change your circle of people that are around you as you've grown? Yeah, actually, but I, I did that a lot. Actively? Some of them just fizzled out. Okay. But a lot of them just happened by themselves. It's just like we met at a point, we grew together, and then everybody just left their own path but we still reconnect sure we still meet up we still sit down we still talk we still exchange ideas but there was a period of time where our growth was together yes you get what i mean yes every skill that i learned you simultaneously learned it with me because you were there mm. every like experience that i had to go through you had to go through it because you were actually there with me. But at some point, we just drifted because it's different paths. Like in 2008, when I started, I started with a, with a music group called JFAM. Mm -hmm. And they're still my friends till, till today. But I remember when we started working in 2008, we used to be together all the time. Mm. Like uh, we used to sleep over at my friend's place for weeks. His mom is like, what are these people doing here? You know what I mean? We just... We, we just, family! <laughs> exactly. We just sit there for like weeks. Get inspired. You know this by now, that we are the number one YouTube show slash podcast that's coming out of the Middle East from Dubai. If you like the idea of having your brand reach at least a million eyeballs per episode, then feel free to reach out to my office on Kevin Abdurrahman. Dot org. Without further delay, let's continue this great conversation. That stayed for a long time, for years. We built a studio our, like Sounds like it was awesome. It was incredible. Man. Yeah. We built a studio ourselves with our own hands. We did not know what building a studio is, but we just did it. We recorded music, we traveled together, we performed together everywhere. But at some point, there came some moments where everybody just went into a different direction. Mm -hmm. Because especially when I got to a point where I was like, 
this is what I want to do with my life. I want to do music. And X Factor happened, and that was my main focus, and it was my career. I realized that I wake up in the morning thinking music, and this is what I want to do. And a lot of the other guys wake up in the morning thinking, I need to go to my job first. I need to put these eight hours in, and then I can come to the studio. And there's nothing wrong with it, which is different. Not at all, mm. which is understandable, because they're supporting themselves, sure. they're supporting their families. But at the same time, I just felt like it was a different energy. Because you have to divide your energy sure. if, you, if you need to focus on a job. Understandable. But I, we got to a point where it's just not the same focus. I felt like I'm, I'm two steps ahead when it comes to the music. Yes. I'm always two steps, two steps ahead. And I felt like, okay, maybe, maybe we're going to drift, but we're still friends. Sure. We remain friends. And... We even still call ourselves J-Fam as a group, even yes. though we're not making music anymore, but we still get together and chill still together. Still the family. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? The J-Fam, which is Jidda family, short for that. And, but yeah, th these things happen. Yeah. You know, people just take different paths in different directions. We just have to be accepting of it. Exactly. And the need for it. Um, the circle of people you hang around with these days, mm. and it's constantly ever-growing, uh, at the speed that you're growing, um, what are you learning? Like what tips? Like what have you learned recently that you might have heard or read about, mm. but you've really just taken it on board in the last year or so yeah. that you feel has helped you be become better? When it comes to the circle around? No, in any aspect. You, know, I mean, you can take this in any direction. Since you mentioned the circle, mm -hmm. it's to avoid yes men. Okay. That's a good one. I realize that this is something that you need to avoid because... Especially in this culture. Extreme. Absolutely. A culture Especially. which is the Middle Eastern culture where it's not like the Western world mm. where honest and open feedback is just accepted. Yes. Mm. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. Nobody likes to be criticized over it. And they take it personally. That's very true. Yeah. So having yes men around while not having self-awareness that this is just stalking my ego and if this keeps happening, I'm gonna get to a point where I'm not really gonna accept anything else mm. than everybody agreeing with everything I do. And I've seen it happen in front of me. People go to a point where if you criticize them or criticize something that they did or you try to redirect them to, to a certain situation, they take it personally. And I understand that. Yes. I get it, because at some point, I was that kind of personality. Mm. I would listen. I would listen to somebody who had a criticism on something that I did, or, for example, a song that I did, and they tell me, oh, but, like, you could have done better on this part, or these lyrics were kind of, uh, they weren't so good. Maybe you could have said something like that. I used to take that personally even though I don't react, mm -hmm. but it used to bother me. And that feeling of being bothered bothered me even more. Yes. I was like, why am I bothered? That's fine. I, I should understand this. You know what I mean? So I realized that having people around you that are not, they're not scared to poke you a little bit. Yes. As long as their intention... It's all about the intention. Yeah. Their intention is to help you get better. It is all about the intention. Because somebody can say something that sounds nice, but the, you can feel the intention. Mm. That feeling tells you they don't intend very well. You know yes. What I mean? Yes, it's all about the intention. So some quick fire questions. How do you deal with fame? Fame? Yes. If you could go back and advise yourself mm. and give yourself heads up, what would you, what would you say? What would be some of the things you'd, mm. you'd want to have? I say this again for aspiring artists in any field or yeah. any individual who might find themselves because it can happen overnight. Yes. Like you, you put in the yards, what seems like overnight success, it could take you 20 That's years, true. but then suddenly you're in the spotlight, you mm. have your wave and your surge, and now you're in the spotlight. Mm. What would be your tip of dealing with fame? Uh, since you said the word wave, if you're a surfer, mm -hmm. and if you're riding a wave, yes. and you take six hours riding the wave, mm -hmm. where are you gonna end up? On the shore, right? You're gonna go back home. Yeah. You gotta have an anchor. You have to have an anchor. You have to have a home to go back to. Yes. 
Because if you're just riding the waves and you're just riding and you're going into the ocean because it's very amazing, you're going to drown at some point. Mm. Or you're just going to get lost. Sure. You got to go back. You got to have an anchor. And an anchor can be your friends. Yes. The people that, are, that have been around you for as long as you remember, before your fame. Yes. Your hometown, your family, your, uh, your neighborhood. You know what I mean? These places or the, those people, you need to, co to keep those people around because mm. I truly do believe in the aspect or the, the idea of an anchor. Wherever you go, you just need to go back. Yes. And that is what's going to keep you grounded. You know what I mean? Because people get affected by fame because it strokes their ego, because it gives them a, an inflated uh, sense of self. Sure. They feel like they're more important than what they are because they're dealing with people that give them that feeling. Yes. And they just get immersed in that because it's, it's nice. I like that. Let me, let me stay there. I don't want to go back. I want to stay there for a little bit longer. Mm. It's a nice wave. I want to keep riding. I want to keep riding. And then they realize they're lost. You know what I yes, mean? Yes, true. So I truly do think about it. Whenever I go and do everything that I want to do when it comes to music, I travel or go on stage or do interviews and things like that. When I go back to my friends, they don't make me feel like I'm an artist. They remind me that I'm Hamza. I'm, I'm the, the, the person that, that, that was their friend, that's their friend, that grew up with them or that got to know them at a certain point in life. And then I go back to that, yeah, this is who I am. That's what I do. But this is who I am. So mm. I, I, I try so hard to not lose those people. And it's active. Yes. It's, it's something you have to it actively do yourself, yes, right? it is active. Like, there are some people, there are some relationships that might fizzle out. Yes. And not work out. But there will always be a few people. But like for me, it's, I, I count them on one hand. Yes. You know what I mean? There, there are those few people that will always keep you grounded and bring you back. Yeah. So it's, it's to have an anchor and to always go back home. That's nice, man. Yeah. That's real good. Whether it's a mental home, an actual home, people. Yeah. Like, pff, come back. Exactly. Yeah. Stay grounded. Yeah. Yeah. Grounded. yeah. Exactly. How do you deal with disappointment? Mm. Because in life, and whatever we choose to do, there's going to be plenty of it. Mm. That's um, true. And you know, there will be a lot of people who've seen your interviews. They see your mm. shows. I mean, you hit fifty thousand, hundred thousand people in terms of mm. stages. There's millions of people that see you. You know, through the camera, on mm. social media, on TV. You're a hero to a lot of people. Mm. And when we look up to you know individuals who we see as heroes, we just think that every decision they made is right. Yeah, Everything yeah. goes their way. Mm. They don't fall off the, that wave, the board that yeah. they're waving on. Yeah. But the reality yeah. is, we do. everyone that faces disappointment. So. Mm. How do you deal with it? Or maybe you can, you can take us to a, a recent disappointment and how you dealt with it or whatever comes to your mind. Dealing with disappointments used to be difficult. Uh, because again, it affects the ego. Yes. And you feel like, damn, if people saw that, it's not going to look good. Mm. It's really, a lot of times, it's all about self-image. Yes. Like when something happens, you go like, if somebody's seen that, it's not going to look good on me. But I, I believe that at some point, and today, if anything disappoints me, I just go like, well, the next one will work out. Mm. It just got to that point. You're going to have faith. Yeah, it just got to that point. You know what? Because it's a wave. Yeah. We're going to go up, we're going to come down. Yes. It's going to happen. So when you feel like you're at the apex and you're like, wow, this is amazing, everything is amazing, you have to remind yourself at any moment now, this is not you being pessimistic. Or no, anything, no, it's just the reality. Like, at any moment now, I might need to dip again and reach that valley. But even if I go down there, I'm going to go back up again. Mm. And the same thing, you need to have the same thought process. If, you, if you're down, if you're at a moment of disappointment, you just need to remind yourself that if I do the right thing, if I keep working, if I stay consistent yes. and patient and not let this stop me from doing what I set to do from the start, eventually I'm going to go back up. Yeah. So I always remind myself of that. 
Always. That's really powerful, man. Mm. That, that's, I think that's the only way because a lot of people, when they get disappointed, they don't think about the fact that a good day is going to come. Yes. You know, they don't think about that. The whole idea of you being disappointed is because you were at a good place and you did. Yes. You cannot just keep going down. Yes. At some point, you went to a good place because you were down. And it, it was a good place because it's different from how it was a year ago. Mm. So if you fall down, you're going to go back up again. Just... Since you mentioned down, it's so easy, and I'm guilty of it. I'm not mm. sure about yourself, but it's so easy to have a pity party. Yes. Right? Mm. When things are down. But I liked your thought on the fact that the tough times, the times where either you face it down or things are wrong or you're not mm. feeling your best or you're stressed out or whatever the situation mm. is, you can use it as a moment of inspiration. That is true. And you use John Lennon as a... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As exactly. an example. Could you tell that story? Because I loved... I was like, wow, this guy's way of thinking is absolutely amazing. Mm. Uh, because it, it, all, it happens to every single one of us where we can have a good excuse to throw a pity party, mm. and we do, and we can just That's simmer true. in it for years. But you know what? Sometimes it's necessary. Sure. Sometimes it's necessary. If you take some time to go like... Maybe sometimes you need to actually schedule it. Like, okay, this disappointment happened. This weekend, come on over for exactly. a pity party. Exactly. You know, some people do this, actually. Exactly. Yeah. You're going to go like, you know what? Bring I'm, your friends. I'm going to grieve for a little while. Yeah. I'm going to pick some time, and I am going to soak in it. Yeah. And when that time is over, I need to get back up. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. It's good. Look, we're going to swipe wipe the sweat and all of that and get up and get back so yes you know what I mean so sometimes it's necessary yes it's actually effective what you're saying yeah it's yeah. sometimes it's necessary to go into that emotion yeah like go deep into that emotion feel every aspect of it so nothing is left for you to be surprised by at any point mm. you're gonna go like oh there's a part of grief I did not feel I'm gonna take two hours and get into it no like take the time and again, we go back to you dissecting your emotions and understanding them and being self-aware. Mm. And understanding that these are the number of emotions that I'm going to go through through this disappointment. Let me go through them. And if you have people around you that can help you do that, ask for their support. Mm. And go through those emotions. Don't neglect them. That's fine. Yes. And then after that is done, all right, let's go back up. What did we learn from that? Let's take the minutes of the meeting and go like, okay, that's what I felt. Maybe I can write a song about this. Maybe I can write a song about that. Maybe I can write a chapter in my book about this emotion that I felt. Yes. You know what I mean? And you go back and you take something from it. Will you tell us the, uh, the story? Oh. I'll let you tell it. The John Lennon story. Yeah. Yeah, we need to remind me of that. No worries. I think you were saying that there was a, a quote of his where he goes, I was down, depressed, and fat. You know why I want you to remind me of that? Because I wrote that whole thing three hours before going on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I, like a last minute I, thing. I was doing my research. You're a true yeah. Arab, brother. You're a true Arab. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we do it, last minute. Three hours. <laughs> yeah. I researched the Michael Jackson story, I researched the Elvis part. Researched there was also the, a writer. Yeah. Well, I don't consider myself a writer. No, no, no. The, there was also the example of a writer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Polio. What's, what's his name? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And there was that... Uh, Let me find singer. that quote. There was a singer who wrote a song for his wife's... Uh, That's the one who suffered from polio, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He couldn't walk. So at a stage in his life, John Lennon said, I was fat, depressed, and crying out for help. Mm. And that's where the song helped. Through, Which is one of the Beatles. The, it's one of their uh, biggest songs, yeah, right? Man, it's one of the songs that actually made the Beatles, and it's I th I'm sure that's one of the songs that is still most played right now. And these songs that come from those deep emotions, they stay. Mm. And sometimes, if you really ask the artists who wrote these songs, are you can you listen to those? Sometimes these artists will tell you, I can't, you know because it I mean? takes them back to that place. 
Yeah, but when you invest so much emotion into something, it just resonates with people. Mm. A lot of people connect to it, and a lot of people feel it. This is what makes a song timeless. Because again, if we're gonna create a song for it to just be a hit on the radio, you're not going by what's trending. You're going by emotions. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna realize that that song is just it's just the jewelry. Mm. That song is, ju is just the jewelry, but and, and and it's the clothes. But the deep song is the person. It's the actual person. Mm. It's the actual emotion. Like the the naked person with nothing on them. You know what I mean? The vulnerable person. Even if it's a happy song, if it's a happy song, but it's it's from a really honest emotion, it resonates and it stays for a while. Yeah. You know, Michael Jackson, for example, Don't Stop Till You Get Enough, it's a, it's a happy song, but it will always remain timeless. Nobody's gonna forget this. Yes. Because it's one of, it's from a real emotion. Speaking of Michael Jackson, my nephew Kareem, hmm? you know, every time I'm hanging out with him, we're in the car, it's Michael Jackson's CD. <laughs> He's got the tracks on, number four, and then he commands the order. He's, so, he's five and a half. Bro, really? Michael Jackson, morning, as when he wakes up, to the time he goes to sleep, honestly, it got, Michael Jackson got to him so much that I had to stop playing for a while. You'd wake up in the middle of the night and say, just beat it. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, I'm like, go to sleep. <laughs> How old is he? Five, five and a half. Yeah, and he commands it, he goes, repeat, because he's sitting in the back mm. seat, he's like, press repeat, because he can see if it's on yeah, repeat yeah. or not. I'm like, okay, sir, yeah. push it on repeat. It's very interesting for me when I see a young kid Generations. loving Michael Jackson. Yeah. Right now, I mean, right magic. now. That's magic for, for me as a kid listening to it, wanting to be like him, trying to dance like him. Exactly. My kid doing this, that's magic. And it's different because what at the time, you? We, yeah. At the time we were watching Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson was alive. He was still here. And also the only source. Yeah, exactly. He was still here. We would see his interviews, we would watch, and, and we would understand what was going on. But for somebody who was young, who did not see Michael Jackson, who did not experience Michael Jackson in, in the way that we did seeing the new songs hit the market, and it creates a buzz and all of that. Those little kids, they did not experience yeah. that, but they have a, a strong connection with Michael Jackson. I'm like, wow. I don't know whether to be impressed by Michael or by the, the child, <laughs> really. Because I'm like, this kid has amazing taste. Because it's Michael Jackson. Since we brought up Michael Jackson, his producer on, uh, on the album Dangerous, Teddy Riley. Teddy Riley, yes. You, you got to hang with him. Yes, I got to meet Teddy Riley. He came Wh to Dubai. What did you learn from the interaction experience? Did he ask for advice? What's something that's memorable of your interaction together? Man, when we sat down, first of all, Teddy Riley's such an amazing person, mm. like an amazing soul. And the energy that you get while sitting with that person is just. You, you wouldn't even think that this person hung out with Michael Jackson. You know what I mean? You feel like you're chilling with a friend. And then you listen to the music that he plays and you're gonna go like, wow. You're like legend. Yeah. yeah. I can't believe this. One of the things that he told me, which uh, an advice that I will never forget, I did not apply it fully yet because it, it seemed, it, it made me kind of scared. Kind of. But I say it to people when I say it. He's like, do you rap? I said, yes. He's like, do you sing? I said, yes. Do you dance? Yes. Do you rap in Arabic? I was like, I used to. Do you sing in Arabic? I was like, I don't, but sometimes I do. He's like, all the things that you can do, do them. Everything that you can do, Everything that you're capable of doing, do it. And at some point, either you or the people that you're going to show your art to, they're going to decide which one they gravitate more towards. Mm. And then maybe you're going to focus more on that. Well, that's a good one. Yeah. It scared me, man. It scared. is scary. 
Yeah, I was like, I, but I feel like I want to do this. I understand. Yeah. But anything that you feel like you can do when it comes to your art or whatever path that you choose to do, do them. Why are you scared? Is it because it's, it, it forces you to face discomfort? Yes. Because it's a lot comfortable to focus on what you're good at, exactly. what I can nail all day, every exactly. day, hit it, I can sing it. Exactly. It takes, you, it takes me out of my comfort zone. Especially the part about singing in Arabic. Yeah. I'm like, that is not my domain. I did not grow up listening to Arabic music. This is, some, this is a, like, a new space for me to it's venture a different in. different scale, different... Exactly. Different, like, I'm, I'm not a singer, but... But yeah, yeah exactly. Like, venturing into that is something that is like... You got to do it. You got to make it your own. Whatever it is, you got to make it your own. And then people are going to listen to that. Mm. And you're going to have people that are going to like this thing. Other people that are going to like this thing that you do. Other people are going to like the other thing that you felt discomfort doing. But then you're going to encompass a lot of people. And if you feel like so many people are gravitating towards one thing, you can focus on that. That's actually great advice. Yeah. That's great advice. And it goes back to what you said, like try everything. Yes, you know I mean? yeah. And then you're gonna find yourself in it. And when you find yourself in that, are you willing to take the sacrifices and take the steps to go through mm. it or not? That's what it is. How do you manage your time? Especially because as you become more successful, mm. you're more wanted. Yes. There is an expectation on you to deliver in this day and age as well to uh, create content to mm. break through the noise yes. to stand out from the competition um, demands of you yes events you're pulled in 50 mm. or you can get pulled into 15 different directions exactly how do you say yes and no to things do you have a system do you have a certain guideline where you go it needs to meet this criteria yes when it comes to when it comes to the jobs that i get or the request that I get to go and perform or to create a song for, for an entity or for a company or for an ad or things like that, there are parameters that I go with mm. and set of rules that I have to set, sit down and, and go like, if it, if it meets all those uh, check boxes, mm -hmm. then I'm going to go with them. And if they don't, then I... I shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to managing my time, I'm still struggling with that in all honesty. I appreciate your honesty, man. I'm still struggling yeah. with that. Like in my personal life yes. and in my creation and in going to the studio and trying to create something or the gym or everything else, I'm still trying to find it. No, you, I mean, you look pretty good. Hopefully, I'm, I'm, I try to get there. But I'm still trying to manage it. You know what I mean? It, I feel like it takes time. Because mm. for a long period of time, I was procrastinating and I did not even know what procrastination is. Mm. And the moment that I found that word, I'm like, this is me. You know what I mean? This is what I've been doing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is what I've been doing. This long word that I don't know how to spell. Yes. That's, exa that's explaining what I've been going through. So managing my time, I would love to take advice from you about that. I mean, what I mentioned was an example of productivity and time management. Mm -hmm. When, I mean, it's, you've also mentioned this where to be inspired by an idea, mm. it's not necessarily a new idea. It's, yes. it's available already yeah. there and mm. somehow you've, you've taken it and mm. you've made it your own. Um, but I don't think anything that I do is, is new. I just mm. spend time listening to great folks and I, and I read and mm. I've just noticed that achievers, or when I'm yeah. working with a lot of great folks, I notice that one of the things they're good at is managing their time and managing their energy. Yes. Right, because one of the, there's only a limited amount of energy you have. Mm. And you gotta go, am I spending it driving around? Am I yeah. spending it in useless meetings? Am mm. I spending it, you know, doing what I, you know, driving True. to get food, catching up with a friend, and then coming back to try and continue my process? Or so, so it's discipline. Yeah, it's, exactly. Discipline is a tough thing. It's so, hard, man. No one said it was yeah, easy. Yeah, man, discipline. Yeah. That's why it's called discipline. You know what I mean? Discipline is tough. It's one of the things that I, I really try to 
pay attention to and keep in my mind. And one of the one of the new techniques that I started using right now, a lot of people, a lot of creatives use it, but mm. I have a whiteboard at home and I just write on it. And I make sure that when I get up from bed, it's over there and I see it. Mm. And I see what I need to do either today Boom. or next week or whatever, you know what I mean? And whenever I get a new idea, I just make sure I write it down. Even if I don't know when I'm going to do it, but I need to make sure that it's there. Like seeing it, when, when I keep seeing it, I feel like it gets engraved in your mind and that's when you do it. Especially if it's something that you've been putting out on the side and, and not doing for a while. When you keep seeing it, it's like you're reminding yourself. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And that's something new that I'm using and I feel like it's taking effect right now. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. We, uh, we did an interview with uh, DJ Bliss. All right. Yeah, and um, one of the things he has we have is... a song together, me and DJ Bliss. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Heck, we're going to put the link to it. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. For sure. Okay, cool. What's it called? Uh, Everything About You. Nice. All I right. Did that, I think 2013 or 2014, something like that. Yeah. He's got a list of affirmations every day. Yes. Boom. I was, I was on reading the, about on that the mirror. yesterday. Mm. And then he's constantly reading it. And he goes, just... Mm. This is something that you do, you know, are you willing mm. to pay the price of just yeah. putting this and reading it? Do they work? This is what I want to know. Man, he goes, try it out. You'll see. Like for him, it's been, it's been magical. And I believe mm. in it. But it requires a discipline of doing it every day. Yeah. You can't That's help it. Them, man. Yeah, when, when you think about it, it's like seeing your goal every day. Yeah. If it's out of sight, it's out of mind. Mm. That's why the saying is there, yeah. out of sight, out of mind. Mm. Have it in front of you every day. This is what I got to do. It's that focus. Mm. Similar yeah. to when you, you purchase a new car and then you start noticing everyone has the same brand. Exactly. It was there the whole time. Exactly. But exactly. now it's just in your focus. That's exactly what I was going to say. Like if, if you're going to say, for example, something very simple, I am rich. Yes. Or I am wealthy. Yes. If you keep saying that for a while, you're going to notice the opportunities that are going to make you 100%. Rich and wealthy, 100%. You know I mean? Because it's always in your mind and you're like, "Oh, I met this person. If I introduce him to this person, they can make money and I can make money with them." Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, to me, when I think about it that way, I'm like, "Yes, they they do work." Because the words we speak starts with a thought. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And as long as you get this right, that's what it is. It they all comes out reality, good. Yeah. Yeah. They manifest. The, the business of music, you said something and I was like, oh, I, I want to I ask you, your perspective on the, the business of music, how do you see this region, how do you see the, just the, the entire business model because it is changing mm. now with the platforms, with not requiring yes. to have record labels. Mm. I'm asking you this because of something I heard Will I Am say. Yeah. And he goes, I'm paraphrasing here, but something along the lines of, he goes, I created two albums, made 20 or 25 grand out of it, mm. and then... I created a piece of music for a brand and I bought my mom a house. Yes. And he goes, that's when I realized that's where the business is. That's how you make a different kind of level money. Mm. When, when you're licensing music to say the likes of Apple or the many things, or I think he did the song for Expo 2020. Oh, he, yeah, he's yeah, actually yeah. on it. So he would have really? paid quite a few houses for it <laughs> compared to creating an album. You see, we don't have that business module set up over here. We don't have it set up yet. Yet. Yet, yeah. We don't have it. I think some companies tried to bring it over here mm -hmm. to the region, to the Middle East, but they didn't succeed. Okay. And they left and went back. I don't know which company was it. Was it ASCAP or BMI? I'm not sure which one. But we don't have that set up here yet. Some artists, like, for example, I was having this conversation with a friend of mine who's a music producer, Ryan Bailoni. Mm -hmm. one of the best music producers here in the region. And he was telling me that he was having a conversation with another guy who owns a company that licenses music and, and buys catalogs. And they were saying that Mariah Carey's song, All I Want for Christmas, that song by itself, within a year, brings in more money than all the rest of her catalog. Wow, all because of the money. licensing. Exactly. Because it's a song that is guaranteed to be played every year. Wow. Every Christmas, you're going to hear that song everywhere. It's December and Mariah Carey's song. There you go. <laughs> in yeah. any country. In and I've country. been to over 100 countries. Everywhere. In every country. <laughs> everywhere. And 
the money is just coming in. But the problem is we don't have that business model set up over here in order for me to license music and benefit from it. Unless I take my music outside and I shop it. For example, I go to the States or to Europe or to the UK and try to push the music over there. Unless I do that. But a lot of people cannot get out of here. Or a brand that says we're launching this. Yeah. Can you please come and make a song for us? And then but you... even the brands over here, like when you license it, they only give you like a one-time pay. Uh huh. And that's it. That's over a different here. model. Yeah. Right. But when it comes to all the brands outside, it's a different thing. Like Skyfall, Adele's song, which is another information that I got from my friend Bailuni. That's a James Bond song, right? Yeah. Yeah. That song is making like more money than the rest of the catalog as well for Adele. Interesting. Yeah, because, because the movie is always there. And I think they licensed that song for another ad. I don't know which ad was it. Okay. Was it Mercedes or something like that? I'm not sure. But these artists, they get those opportunities mm. where one song just makes the rest of their career. Sure. I can't wait for, for this business to be set up over here. So. Us as artists can benefit from that. One hundred percent. That's not here. That's not here, and it makes some musicians sad. You know what I mean? Because yes. we always get this one-time fee, and that's it. And we have to go back and grind and grind and grind. But hopefully, one day it'll happen. I'm sure the value of art will catch up. Hopefully, man. It will. I hope so. What musical genres are your go-to? Hmm. If I want to get inspired or if I just want to listen to something. Take it in any direction, yeah. If you want to relax. Alternative folk. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I did not know what that is till I heard is it. Is there a song that I would recognize? There is Bon Iver. I love to listen to Bon Iver. Do you know Bon Iver? No. B-O-N-I-V-E-R. I'll check it out. Bon Iver, yeah. okay. That, uh, I believe that is alternative folk. That music for me is something that I would play in the background while I'm doing something that requires tranquility. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? I just want to chill. Maybe I want to read. Mm -hmm. Maybe I want to type something. So alternative folk is something that I really like to listen to. Funk as well. Okay. Yeah. While I'm cooking. Funk is cool. Oh, we've got that in common. Cooking. All yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love cooking, man. What else? Do you, do, yeah, so I'll, I'll come back to the mm -hmm. music, but I'm going to just quick mm -hmm. segue. For tranquility, is cooking part of your thing of yes. just yeah, yeah, yeah. finding exactly. tranquility? Exactly. Because I relate that to creativity, by the uh -huh. way. Because sometimes I like to go to the grocery shop or a big supermarket. I just look at different spices that I never use. And I go like, I just, I want to try this. I want to see how this is going to taste with that and all of that. And I just go back. We're going today. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just go back and I try things. I like cooking. I oh, like let's cooking. do a, Let's do a cook session. Do they we call it a jam session? We'll we do a should, cook session. Man. Adam on so the sad. <laughs> Boys of this day and age, right? <laughs> Our jam session. Yeah, exactly. Just I'm, a the... I'm a good chopper. I'm a chop. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm gonna do the dishes. You do the spices. <laughs> <laughs> I like cooking. Cooking is something very amazing for me, honestly. Like, I'd, I'd stay hours in the kitchen and I'd take my time. Yeah. Yeah, I like to take my time with it, you know? Because I truly do feel like it's, it's kind of therapeutic. Yes. Honestly, you know? I started taking my time when I, um, I mean, this cooking thing, I pretty much whoever mm. says I'm into cooking, I'm like, let's cook together. It's yeah. like my thing. <laughs> I was cooking with a friend of mine, she's a yoga instructor. Mm. And on this occasion, for some reason, I was rushed. Mm. And she's like, Kevin, this is cooking. Yeah. You're chopping like it's business. <laughs> she goes, Take I can. Time. Yeah, she goes, my back is like, our back was mm. against each other. She goes, but I can feel the energy. I don't want to <laughs> eat this food. She goes, Take. And I was like, okay, she's right. Mm. I like, gotta take my time. I'm doing this for a reason. That's very interesting when you talk about energy as well. Yeah. Because a lot of people don't like to eat outside. And some people can articulate why, mm. and a lot of people don't. But a lot of people would say, because I don't know the energy of the person that cooked my food. I don't know what they were feeling at the moment. I don't know what kind of mind state they were in when they were preparing my food for me. 
So I'm just going to eat something, and I don't know what kind of energy it's going to get for me. Ooh. This is why in, in Arabic, we always say uh, nafas. Uh -huh. So if, if somebody cooked a plate, and somebody cooked the same plate with the same ingredients, it's just this one tastes different. Because the energy that they cook this with... It's their heart different. and soul. Exactly. Yeah. That's why they say cooked with love. Yeah. It's, like it's, it's just, yeah, it's words that we use, but sometimes we don't know what they mean. But I heard a lot about the idea of, especially when you order delivery. Yes. They say that you don't know, for example, where the vegetables or the meats came from. And then it, the, a chef was working on them, but you don't know what kind of energy that chef has. Mm. And then somebody's taking the food and bringing it to you, and you don't know what kind of energy that food was exposed to while coming to you. And when you're thinking about it, it's all rush, 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 exactly. rush. Everything is being rushed. Maybe somebody had an accident on the way, or maybe he was yelling at somebody, mm. and then he just gives you the food and gets the money and leaves. Never and thought about it. Yeah. Oh, well, that's a good one. That's why they say, like, when you cook something at home, it's just a different vibe, a different energy. And even as simple as, regardless of how much ingredients are in it or the spices or whatever, if it's simple, Oh, it's yeah. filling. Oh, yes. You know what I mean? And it tastes good. It hits the nice. spot, yeah. And it makes you feel good. Yeah. So I was actually reading about that two days ago. And I was like, that makes sense. That's a good take on it, man. Yeah. Never thought about it that way. It's real good. I apologize for cutting you off. You were telling me about music. <laughs> we yeah, just burst off into... What are the genres? R&B, of course. But R&B is my genre. But I honestly only listen to it because... I just want to get some inspiration that are very technical and practical. Uh -huh. But the other genres that I listen to, I listen to for the feel. Mm -hmm. I don't like the subject matter of R&B music today. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel related to it. A lot of the things that they talk about, I feel like uh, I can't relate to that. There are... You're more old school. Yeah, because I feel like it was different. With the, the way that with the way, solid content. Yeah, the way that they expressed was different. And a lot of the songs today, I feel like, and this is a new thought for me. And it's it's different to hear to hear it from a singer. But I feel like I don't like the songs that portrays the artist as a weak person. Okay. Like emotionally weak. You know when you said that, who I thought of? Who? August Alsina. There you go. He's got a great mm -hmm. voice, but he's, yeah. he, that's exactly what you he feel like it, You feel like it's a weak person singing. Like You feel like it's a person who needs somebody to pick them up. I, I understand. Be a man! There you go. Yeah. I understand, but if it's about life struggle, I get it. Yes. But when it comes the to whininess. love... The whininess. Yeah, but when it comes to love, I truly do feel if you're a man singing, sing like a man. It's so funny he says that, man. You get what I mean? There are some songs that are in different languages, say for example for Kiz with, with Kizomba. Yeah. And I love the tune and I love the melody and I dance to it and it's so mm. good. But a couple of times when friends translate it, I was like, grow some balls. There you go. Yeah. There you like, go. Exactly. And ever since then, I'd be like, I'm like, okay, I'm glad that it's in Portuguese or it's in French or it's in Spanish. <laughs> I don't want to listen yeah, to Yeah, because, or Swahili, because I can just enjoy it. I don't exactly. want to know what it means because I'm worried it's going to put me off. Exactly. And I only... It's so funny he mentions that. I, I, like, I only became aware of that recently because these are the songs that I kept listen to, listening to my whole life. But recently I was like, they <gasps> give me a feeling that I don't want to feel. And then I realized that, okay, they're coming from a place of weakness. It's, if you're a man singing this way, it's really not appealing to women in real life. That's right. They might like to listen to it in songs. Sure. Just like when they see a romantic movie. It's not the reality. Mm -hmm. It's just a movie. Mm -hmm. If you take that character out in reality, it's not going to work for you. So it's the same thing when it comes to music. This is why when it comes to R&B music, I don't feel connected to the R&B today. You're okay with vulnerability, not weakness. Exactly. And there's a, there's a big difference, yeah. there's a big divide. You say you're not listening to music. What are you mm. feeding your mind? What kind of content are you consuming? Oh, that's, that's a very good question. 
And it's something that is, uh, that is going to sound very off what we're talking about. But I'm watching a lot of videos and reading a lot of things about human behavior. OK. Yeah. I want you to elaborate more, please. The reason I, I say that is because I have a quote that I share mm. with my audience, and that's the quality of your results in life mm. is a direct reflection of the quality of your mind. Yes. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And what we say, what we do, really is harbored mm. from the thoughts we have. Yes. And the thoughts we have comes down with the content we choose exactly. to feed it, whether it's people that we hang around with, mm. books we read, or however way we consume things. Exactly. So please tell me more, because this is fascinating. There's a lot of things about human behavior that, uh, like when I, I used to observe a lot of people still, till today, mm. because I'm an introvert. And when you see me in a social setting, you're going to see me just sitting somewhere by myself with my bottle of water, just watching. Or with the people that I know next to me. And I just watch. And I like to understand why people do what they do in mm. different situations. And I always ask myself certain questions like, why would a person do this in that situation? Whatever it is, whether they're in a relationship, whether it's an argument whether when somebody is happy, why do they do something? When they're sad, why do they do that? And I've been trying to read and find out about those things a lot because I found out that it can help me when it comes to songwriting as well. Sure. Because then I'm going to connect with people better if I understand why a certain emotion make somebody feel a certain way, then I will know exactly how to speak about it so I can get to the person who's listening to the song. You know what I mean? Yes. Sometimes you listen to a song, you feel like, man, this song is speaking to me. That's right. Yeah, like every word in there is speaking to me. And this is why I like Frank Ocean, because I feel like the way that he writes, he really gets to, to what you're feeling. You're like, yes, exactly. That's what he's talking about. Mm. So. And because at some point I wanted to study psychology. Interesting. Yeah, at some point I wanted to study psychology. But uh, I had a weak mentality to the point where I was affected by the people around me and what they say and how they're like, man, psychology, why would you study that, man? We're in Saudi. Psychology is not going to get you anywhere. And I was fed all those thoughts to the point where I... You ended up doing business. Yeah, I, I didn't want to do that anymore. But uh, I've always been fascinated by humans and the way that they think, and the way that they feel. Always been fascinated by that. So this is the content that I'm consuming. You know? And that's powerful because it's actually something, like you said, it helps you perhaps write better songs or songs yes. that speak to your audience. Absolutely. I want to ask you, what other tip would you give to perhaps an upcoming artist mm. or someone that wants to break through, you know, cut through the noise? Mm stand out from the competition. If they had to focus on one thing, what would, what would you tell them to focus on? I'd say it's a, hard, it's a hard advice to follow. Because if, I, would, I would like to say don't copy anybody. But that is a hard advice to follow. Because anything that we do is a result of something that we've, we've seen. We've been inspired by, right? Yeah, yeah. or we felt. But what I would say, how I would uh, reinforce that advice is do what feels right in your gut and in your mind and it makes you feel like this is a song that I would listen to if I made it. Mm. You know what I mean? If I made this song, this is a song that I would listen to. It would if have at least the market of one. Yeah, if somebody else made that song, this is a song that I would listen to. Because then you know that it's something that came from you or from your experiences. And for somebody who writes songs, for people who write songs, I would say write from your experience, regardless of whatever your experience is. It really doesn't have to be a, about love, because the music nowadays, it makes you feel like everything you write about needs to be about love, especially when it comes to R&B music and the mm. music that is emotional. But the idea is that just write. Whatever it is that you feel, write about it. Even if you want to write about the feeling in the gym, you, you can be metaphorical about it. And as a songwriter, you need to read. That's a good advice. That is very important. 
you need to read as a songwriter because if you don't, you're only going to recycle the words that you're going to listen to from other songs. I mean, there are some popular artists, one of the things they've done, mm. or really good communicators, one mm. of the things that they've done is they've, they've read through the dictionary. Yes, exactly. Eminem being one of mm. them? Yes. Um, like you said. Yeah, so they go through the dictionary because you really just develop your vocabulary. Exactly. And I really feel that it actually applies to just about anything you do in life because we're all in communication. Mm. Either way, one-on-one -on -one to a larger audience, corporate world, personal relationships, it's important. Mm. So much so that I've decided to do the word of the day with my five and a half year old nephew. Okay. Where I go, okay, today is A, and I mm. go, let's find a word that we don't know. And it forces oh, me yeah, to go to the dictionary mm. because he's also in a phase where he's correcting everything yeah. that I'm saying. So I need to be on point. Exactly. So I'll find a word, actually so go to Google. It's for you both. It is, man. Yeah. I thought it's for him. And I was like, <laughs> this is actually for me. Like today was empathy. It was E. Okay. So I had to, before sharing with him, I go, okay, Kareem, today's word is empathy. Mm. I quickly just went on Google. To find out. What, what does the word <laughs> mean Like for me to be able to explain it? Yeah, to be concise and mm. clear so he gets it. Yeah. yeah. At the end of the day, if he's my audience and he doesn't get my message, which was a total yeah. fail. <laughs> right? How am I going to give it yeah. to Yeah. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to, I'm not a good communicator if I can't mm. deliver it effectively mm. to my audience who's five and a half year old. That is a good exercise. And you know, I go, it's empathy and empathy mm. means to understand how someone else is feeling. Yeah. As simplistic as it can. And so we try to work on the example. Well, it means like if Hakim falls off mm -hmm. and you see him in pain, you kind of feel his pain. And it's like, no, I don't get it. I'm like, okay, that's, that's you, another challenge. You got, you got to find another way to explain That's it. another challenge we're going to come back to. That's very interesting, man, because uh, my friend, he has a, I think his son is four-year-old as well. And he listens to the most unexpected music ever, like, he listens to Michael Jackson. I think he listens to Frank Sinatra or something like that. Mm. A couple of days ago, he was listening to Careless Whisper. Wow. Yeah, and he's young, like he's still, and he was telling him, when I grow up, I want to be I'm Hamza songwriter. <laughs> Man, that made me happier than any other compliment that I, because I feel like kids are genuine. Yes. Yeah, they, yes. They're, they're, they're not going to lie. If they like something, up. they'll tell you. If they don't, they're going to tell you that they don't 100%. like it. 100%. Yeah, and like my friend was showing me the YouTube his history of his son's uh, like video that he watched, and they're all my songs. That's awesome. And like, I did not imagine that my songs are going to be appealing to somebody that What a young. great compliment, yeah. yeah. To me, man, that was, that was like a, a screenshot. Like, I'm like, I'm going to keep this. That's gold. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because I truly do feel like if you, if you get to a kid's mind, yes. the thing that you do, you feel like, uh, yeah, there is something in It's there, that true know? emotion. Exactly, because there are no filters. There are no filters. They're not, they're not going to give you excuses. They're not going to try to connect whatever they hear just because they know you. That social programming is not there No yet. baggage, nothing. Exactly. Purest emotion. So if it gets into their minds and they feel like, yeah, this is something I would receive, I like it. You go like, yeah, this is, that thing that I did really works. Yeah. You know? And that's timeless. T exactly. Yeah, with what you were saying. Um, you mentioned criticism because there are two types of criticism, mm. um, self-criticism mm. and the criticism of others. Yes. And you mentioned that you're self-critical. Yes. I'm asking this question from a place because I'm a self-critical person. Mm. It's helped me become great at what I do, mm. but it also held me back. Yes. How do you st strike or have you found a way to balance that self-criticism to help you Excel mm. without it holding you back. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> the struggle is real. About it a lot. But the progress that I made is I realize when it's holding me back. Yes. I know that, okay, this criticism is actually holding me back. This is the progress that I made. 
but the balance, I'm still juggling with that. Because when we, when, we, when we were off camera, you mentioned about collaborating. Yes. And how when it's your own song, you're like... <sighs> exactly. You're more self-critical. And that's when it holds you back. Because when, you're, when I'm working on somebody else's song, I feel like the ideas are just flowing. And I used to think that it's just because somebody else's song. But I realized that the same flow of ideas exists when I'm working on my song. But I dismiss them. Mm. I go like, no, 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 this is not going to be good. This is not going to be good. Without any logical explanation to why I think it won't be good. But when it comes to somebody else's song, it's not that I don't care about it, so I just put any idea. But I just feel like, no, this idea will actually work. I'm more confident here. But with my song, I feel like, nah, I need to make sure it's right. I need to make sure that it's good. And that's when the held back happens. Mm. And this is why I'm still trying, to, still trying to fix that. If you find a solution, please holler at a brother. Yeah, it's, but it's, it's, it's the self-awareness at first, and mm. then being, you're realizing and actively going, let's push on with exactly. it, let's push, let's push on. No matter what, let's push on with it. But it is a struggle, there. bro. They're trying to get there, bro. Best piece of advice you've received? Best piece of advice. Hmm. It's a three-part question, so I'm going to drop it to you okay. while you're thinking. Best piece of advice you've received, mm. best piece of advice you've received and did not apply mm. for whatever reason, and in a world where everyone's giving opinions, rubbish advice that you've received, mm. and hopefully you didn't take it on board. <laughs> but In any which order you like. Best advice I've received, but I didn't apply it. Or you didn't apply earlier and then maybe you're applying it now or... Mm. I mentioned this from a place because one that I vividly remember was told to me when I was super young was the importance of focus. And yeah. clearly it was told to me because I did lack focus. Mm. And I stayed away from it. I probably still stay away from it, but not mm -hmm. at such a degree. Yeah. For so long, when in actual fact, that single tip would have helped me immensely grow leaps and bounds oh. had I trained and just focused mm, focus. because focus is also discipline and mm. it's doing something consistently exactly. day in day out whether you feel like it or not exactly one advice that I did not apply yet which I think aids in focus as well is to write everything down yes right if I have an idea I just write like only recently do I put the notes yes but writing is different yes when you hold a pen in your hand and you actually write it, it's a complete different, different feeling, energy. 100%. Yeah, it's a different energy. So holding a notebook like with you all the time and writing, that's one advice that I got. I remember who gave it to me. But I remember it and I always think about how effective it would be if I follow it. Because I feel like when you have an idea, when you have a thought or you're inspired by something or you receive an info, it's here. So you either say it mm -hmm. or you write it down because yes. I feel like that confirms it. Yes. So that is an advice that uh, you reminded me of right now. So I think I'm going to go back and try to apply it. The advice that I listened to, I'd say it's a saying that I read and I took as an advice. Mm -hmm. It's live and let live. It meant a lot to me because at some point I felt like I needed to appease to some people when it comes to my creation or when it comes to music. Uh, Taking care about how other people felt yeah, as opposed to yourself. About, about the thing that I'm trying to put out. Okay. Or how will I be perceived? That is the question that comes to my mind a lot sometimes. Mm. How will people see this? How, how will people think about me if I do this certain thing? And that is one of the things that can hold you back, just like we spoke about self-criticism yes. and how it holds you back. Yes. And I felt like this is one of the things that holds you back. Us caring about the opinions of others. Yes. So even the idea of when you see somebody doing something, if it does not affect you in a way, or if, it, if it's not going to affect their surroundings negatively, then maybe you shouldn't have an opinion about it. 
You know what I mean? Mm. It's a lot of things that are, that has to do with, even if that's in social media, I see that in social media a lot. People feel like, people feel the need to express and say something about something that they see. They feel that. Or they feel the need to allow something they see to affect them. Mm. And I, f I see that in, in Twitter a lot. No shade to Twitter, but I see that on a lot. It's like, I feel like I'm watching the news. Because when you watch the news, you leave with bad energy. Mm. Every time you see something on the news, like when it's done, you feel like, what is this heavy feeling that I'm feeling? You know what I mean? So I feel like there is some kind of distance that we need to consciously sure. put out sometimes to things that we know don't have any kind of effect on our lives. And it's not positive. Mm. Exactly. Out of the way. In the future, mm. your kids, I'm sure they'll have a lot to learn and they'll be inspired by you. But if you can only leave them with one trait, an attitude, or a skill, mm. and it could only just be one, to give them the best chance of living their best life, mm. what would that be? Give smartly. Give smartly. I, I truly do believe in the idea of giving. Mm -hmm. I truly do believe in the idea of, uh, regardless of whatever it is, because a lot of people may give when it comes to money or advice or love or whatever it is, but they don't do it in a smart way. They're very naive about it. Okay. And if they're naive about it, they're going to face a lot of people who, who I could call vampires. Mm -hmm. And that will not be reciprocated at all. Sure. Or they won't find themselves in a situation where if I give right now, this thing is going to come back to me in a good way. Mm -hmm. But even, I truly do believe, even, even with someone, if someone wants to give, they don't give with the thought that I want this back. To give with no expectations. Yeah. Mm. Like, but in a smart way. So it's like an investment. You don't know where the return of investment is going to come from. Sure. When it comes to, to, to the world and to life and to interactions with people. Like, mm. I could be good to somebody, but the return of investment is not going to come from that sure. person. It's going to come from someplace else. So I need to be aware of that. Give with no expectations. This is important for me because I see a lot of people, they give. And then they expect that to come back. And then it's not, it's not genuine anymore, especially from that person. You're not really giving if the expectation is there. That's not giving. Exactly. Yeah. Because sometimes, sometimes you're going to give something to somebody and it's going to shoot them in life and they're going to go. There is no chance for them to, to give you back. And if you're just going to sit there and expect it, you're just going to put you in a situation of just being sad. Yes. I've seen it mm -hmm. a lot. Especially in, especially in the things that we do, especially in the business, especially when it comes to support. You know, a lot of people go like, I supported this person, but they did not support me back. It happens. You know what I mean? But if you're genuine about supporting that person, just support them. Don't expect yeah. anything back. That's Even if they did not give it back, it's cool. You give when it's the blessing. Yeah. I, I liked your song anyway. Mm. You know what I mean? I liked your performance anyway. I'm just not... I'm now waiting for you to tell me that to me again, you know? Yeah. 500 years from now, history will read, Hamza Hausawi was. <laughs> what would you like it to read? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Hmm. You have to think of something profound. Maybe it could be articulated better, but there are two things that I feel like I really want to give out to the world. It's to motivate people and to entertain them with the music that I do. Mm -hmm. So however I can articulate those two in a book that people will read 500 years from now, I think I'm going to be cool with that. That's very but, nice. But huh? these are the two things that I feel like I really want to give out. These are the two energies that I want to give out to the world. And I, I really believe you're doing that. I hope so. Yeah. I really hope so. I'm sure there'll be a, a lasting legacy of it. Hopefully. Man, um, in a world where it's hard to get people's attention, mm. if you had the world's attention for 60 seconds, it could be an individual that's lost, 
Um, it could be someone who's not sure what they want to do. It could be someone who's a struggling artist mm. or wanting to become an artist. Mm. Um, anything that you know, you'd perhaps tell them if they had the opportunity of having mm. a coffee with you, which is hard to do, um, mm -hmm. but they could have it through this medium on YouTube or listening to it on podcast. Or I would say, and I, and I might direct this to, to the artists and the people that are doing what I'm doing, and I would say it to myself as well mm -hmm. at the same time. Be patient. It's gonna happen. Just be patient, remain consistent, and make sure that you're doing the right things to aid to your art or your craft. Just make sure you're honing your skills. Make sure you're always stepping up and, and gaining more knowledge to the things that you want to do. Mm. And be patient. Don't rush. Just be patient. Because rushing sometimes hinders the process. That's 60 seconds, right? Yeah, and, and li life has a funny way of it. The more you rush, coming from someone who rushed his 20s. The more you rush, the more you're held back. Yeah. <laughs> you feel like you're wasting more time when you're rushing. Which is kind of uh, like a paradox. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You feel like if you're rushed, you're going to get things done faster, but that's not the case. Yeah. Man, I really appreciate you making the time. Man, thank you for having me. I appreciate you, the wisdom that you've shared. Thank you. Um, gems that you've said, uh, sometimes in passing. Mm. Um, guys and girls, I believe that if you resonated with Hamza's voice, that you would have got a lot of gems. But I do recommend that you watch this video or if you're listening to it on podcast to listen to the audio a second time. I go through, as you know, every single interview I go through a second time because I write summary notes which we make available on our website. And every time I've learned so much more the second time around. I guarantee that if you watch this the second time around, if you listen to this the second time, Ryan, you will see the gems that Hamza has dropped. Um, truly profound powerful priceless thank you um, man it's it's really awesome it's a pleasure hopefully not the last time no the first of many bro yeah, the first of many um, if people want to follow you um, what's the best way where's the best place for them to follow you the best platform that I always use is Instagram okay which is Hamza Hosawi the same way that my name is written H-A-M-Z-A H-A-W-S-A-W-I we'll place the link All right. Um, you know where it's available is do you have an ask or a request are you working on a project have something that's out I know you're constantly mm. releasing and you're doing yeah. things do you want them to check something out do you want them to check out your website the last single please check out my last single it's it's available on all platforms uh, and it's called Fallen and stay tuned for a couple of other projects that are coming soon yeah we'll place all the links um, We'll put on the Amazon and the, um, the uh, Spotify Apple. links, mm. Apple. Uh, we'll place it in there for you. For both the links and the upcoming ones as well. We'll, we'll right. constantly update it. Uh, folks, if you have thoughts, comments, uh, you want to elaborate on some of the thoughts that was shared by Hamza. If you have questions, please put them down below. Um, I'll try to answer them. Perhaps we'll get Hamza if he's got the opportunity Let's while flying it. around the world to answer them as well. Uh, otherwise, I'll get another guest to share with you their perspective and answer your questions. As you know, this show has nothing to do with showing off, um, though you could rightfully do so to, <laughs> to a huge extent. The show is about helping you get inspired, get informed, and get going. And I want to say something, if you're not done. Throughout this conversation, I realized a lot of things in me that I still need to work out Yes. On. You know what I mean? And this is something that I appreciate. So. I thank man, you for having me. Man, I, and, and I, I appreciate thank you, you for, sharing. For all these things that you pointed out to me, maybe in passing as well, maybe you didn't realize that, but it's a lot of things that will make me go back and go like, I need to focus on this thing and I need to focus on that thing. And self-awareness for artists and writers and everybody that is creative is extremely, extremely important because we're writing from the heart. We're writing from our own minds. And if we're not self-aware, we're not going to bring something that is genuine. 100%. Yeah. Thank you, man. You're welcome, yeah. my brother. Um, in the words of Snoop Dogg, man, if you're breathing, you're achieving. So always remember <laughs> to you know, be kind, be ambitious, be grateful. I'm Kevin Abdurrahman. This 
is how do they do it? Oh man. Oh brother. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Hold on a second. <laughs> your first album, your first music album yeah, that you purchased one. was in Millennium, Backstreet Boys. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. Early one. <laughs> yeah. On cassette. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Hold up, hold up. And it was, was it the show me the meaning of being lonely? Of course, bro. Man. Oh. I know that word for word, bro. Man, give give us a couple of tunes, please, bro. This is, we're going to close off with just him singing off. But you guys are going to sing with me. Oh, no, hell no. Show I'm gonna me the meaning of being lonely. Oh, takes me back. It's just the feeling I need to walk with. Tell me why I can't be there where you are. There's something missing in my heart. Holy shit. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> Dude. Man, oh, I just, I goosebumps, man. I just I, nostalgic I, about, I love that song, man. That album. That whole album. Bro. Oh, you <laughs> took me back to my teenage years. Man. <laughs> That album, dude. That was great. <laughs>